everybody. Welcome back to the Resleevables Tempest Edition. I'm your host, Cedric Phillips at Cedric A. Phillips on all the things. I am, of course, joined by my partner in crime and a big fan of Tempest, Patrick Sullivan at Basic Mountain on Twitter. Patrick, you know, we've had to eat some crap. Yeah, the first handful of episodes of this show, some uh, some episodes better than others. And of course, we do appreciate your support, your unwavering support. Uh, but look, the dark may be a little rough. Fallen empires may be a little tough. Mirage block, some ups and downs. Chronicles, all downs, no ups. But we're here now. We're here at the sets of people. A lot of people are like, I can't wait till you start getting in a Tempest block and Wrath Cycle and Saga block because that's when I started playing. We're here. Tempest, I have the pack in my hand. We're here, finally. Mirage block is proof of a pretty powerful concept okay. in contrast to the sets that came before it. What if we just took a mana off of everything? Okay, <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> There's just a lot of cards set aside the absolute best cards not even talking about you know the vampire tutors of the world there's definitely some outliers okay but there's just river boas and mana wars and that kind of stuff which would have definitely cost more mana had they appeared in fallen empires of the dark or homelands or any of the sets around that All time right, that, that's definitely true tempest block introduces the question what if we just did that again yeah sure. <laughs> okay sure <laughs> i'm not gonna spoil too much about saga block <laughs> <laughs> well, just, but <laughs> this what, is a pretty what if a powerful, lot of the spells were free this is a pretty powerful concept <laughs> and we're now at a point where it's not just that the power level outliers are really really good and they are mm -hmm. the best cards in tempest block blow the best cards in mirage block out of the water pound for pound it's also the 80th percentile cards and the 50th percentile cards. We're just entering territory where magic is becoming more powerful. There is absolutely power creep occurring at this time. Yeah. Which sometimes that's the that's the bell you gotta ring. Well, you, you gotta, got you gotta take a step forward at some point. Exactly. And it, you know, we've been covering over the course of the series how Arabian Nights, Antiquities, Legends, certainly Alpha Beta Unlimited. A lot of power in those sets, a lot of iconic cards, and then how much that fell off a cliff, really starting with the dark and not really stopping until Mirage. Yeah. Alliances, I guess you could say, is a step in the right direction. They did okay. They did okay. But we're now at an earning point where if you started playing standard around this time, you could basically build competitive decks just out of Tempest. Mm, okay. That is how much better the set was than the sets that came before it, which maybe is right to do or wrong to do depending on the particular conditions uh but you can't just do it until the end of time definitely true and this is this to me is the step of i think mirage is generally speaking a great block the right balance of powerful cards and the powerful cards are generally not the worst bets in the world this is where you can see the foundation for urza block coming of the this is sort of getting out of control a little bit but at the time ah, it's a set and it's powerful and there's stuff going on great so uh i want to give everyone a little warning a little heads up before we dive into the facts of the set this episode is going to be long because this is a really important set in magic's history and we got a lot of information got a lot of facts i got a lot of lore uh we got nine mostly bad cycles we got some new mechanics that are questionable and we have a lot of trivia. So uh, if you are a fan of Tempest or you've got some time to spend with us, uh, don't go anywhere because you're going to learn a lot. So, um, you know what? As I show off this pack with a uh, commander driven Ilvec, I believe. And what do you have there? Uh, also commander driven. Okay. Then I don't. What do you have? I'm pretty sure this guy's commander driven. Oh, uh, is this Valti Eldal? Maybe that's Vora. I don't, I don't know. know. Okay, anyway. <laughs> you know, we tried on that one and we failed. So here's what we're gonna do. Uh we're gonna we're gonna go to the facts of Tempest right now. All right, everybody. I have my computer. 
it is now time to get to the facts of Tempest. But before we do, we got to give a shout out to our wonderful sponsor, Tales of Adventure. You can head over to toamagic.com and check out a selection of over 77,000 SKUs in stock, including 80 pieces of the Power 9, every single revised dual land, and 99% of standard cards for those of you playing in standard RCQs this season. Every order placed with Tales of Adventure comes with free track shipping. UPS next day and two day shipping is offered for orders placed before 8 a.m. And Tales of Adventure has completed over 1 million orders lifetime, so you know you'll be in good hands with Michael Caffrey and his staff. If you'll be attending an event that Tales of Adventure will be at, when you're checking out, you can select the event pickup option. So you can simply pick up the cards you've ordered right at the event you'll be at. You can find a list of events that Tales of Adventure will be at attending on their homepage, toamagic.com. Lastly, when checking out, be sure to use promo code RESLEAVABLES to get 5% off your entire order. Tales of Adventure, Eternal Lives Here. Alrighty, let us dive in and we begin in the simplest of places. Tempest is the 12th magic the gathering expansion uh i think i think hmm, i think the new magic expansion that's coming out outlaws yeah i, th- I think it's number a, a hundred okay so this show's gonna be going around for a little while that's quite the milestone i know wow that's so many sets so many expansions uh tempest was released on october 14th 1997 in paper Got some new fun notes here. Uh, there was a pre-release for Tempest, but I couldn't find the date. So my notes leave it as blank, but just know there was one. And here's how we know. Because Tempest was the first set to feature a special pre-release card, the Mighty Dirt Cow Worm. Uh, the card is non-foil with the word pre-release and the Magic M stamped in gold leaf on the type line. So now we're introducing pre-release cards not only do you have a reason to go to your pre-release because, wow, new set, get to try it first, but now you actually get a card. Yeah, this is a, a work in progress. Oh, yeah, because um, this card stinks. Because this card is rancid and has nothing to do with anything. Yeah. I would try to find a card with buyback or shadow to or, give out. Or one of the characters from Wrath Cycle. Or one of the characters. Maybe. So we're starting from a low bit place. Uh, and it really was weird for a long time. Okay. Uh, I was playing pre-releases, not in Tempest, but a little bit further down the road. And the pre-release spoils you got were typically nothing to do with anything. Sometimes they were regularly printed, not in English, <laughs> sure. which is not the most useful thing when I'm trying to figure out what the cards do. Yep. Getting, uh, uh, you know, Russian fungal shambler or <laughs> apocalypse or whatever it was i forgot about that actually yeah but it is a cool idea uh it's just the it's our not maybe in the most concise or appealing way there's always room for growth mm-hmm. so that's a good thing uh tempest we have more release dates for tempest normally we only have one but uh, uh tempest was also released on december 8th 2008 on magic online uh, with drafts available through April 27th, 2009. So for about a four and a half, five month period, you could draft Tempest when they had to release the old sets. They had to do it at some point. So they did an 08 to get Tempest onto that program. And then Tempest Remastered was a Magic Online exclusive set released on May 6th, 2015, which it's crazy to say that, but almost 10 years ago now. The set featured 269 cards, including basic lands, uh, specially selected from the three expansions of the Wrath Cycle, which of course is Tempest, Stronghold, and Exodus. Those uh, those episodes coming soon. And although cards retained their original illustrations, all cards used a modern frame, and some cards have a different rarity from the original printing. So you know, a remastered set with new frame. Cool. Fair enough. I'm Great. sure that product. Some people liked it. I'm sure, but it was a long time ago. Uh, Tempest was designed by Mark Rosewater, Richard Garfield. Mike Elliott and Charlie Catino. Uh, it was developed by Henry Stern, Mike Elliott, William Jockage, Bill Rose, and Mark Rosewater. And then the art direction was by not Sue Ann Harkey. I'm sure some of you thought it was. It's Matt Wilson, somebody new in charge of the art. I do have one quick note uh, for Richard Garfield, who again designed the set or helped design it. It was the first set since Antiquities that featured Richard Garfield in an active role as a designer. Cool. Now, I don't know if that means that the stakes were really high. Maybe Magic was in a bad spot, so they had to bring Richard back. Maybe it was Richard Garfield was like, yo, I want to design a set. I have gotten to work with Richard a little bit on some 
not magic related stuff over the years. Okay. I would guess it's the second thing. Just kind of wants to R- do some Richard stuff. sometimes just gets the itch. Eh, and okay. you know, one day I wake up with an email and my boss is like, Yeah, Richard said over 40 designs for this random set we're working on. Just find ones that you like and try to put them in there. That's so, fun. Yeah. I, I think that sometimes Richard just kind of gets the inspiration. Respect. Love what you do. Let's talk about how many cards are in the set. There's 350 black bordered cards. We have 110 rares. We have 110 uncommons. We have 110 commons. Uh, if you're counting home, that's 330. We got to get to 20 more, and those will be the 20 basic lands. Tempest expansion symbol. Let's transition there. It's a cloud with a lightning bolt to symbolize Wrath's turbulent sky and Tempest's tumultuous plot. And what a contrast this expansion symbol compared to Mirage's. Okay. You have just a lush tree, and now you pivot to this. Mm -hmm. The art style of this set I would describe as very brutalistic, the uh, very um, not teeming with life. Yeah. A very harsh landscape. Yeah. And that comes through on the basic lands, the expansion symbols, your rank and file cards, even setting aside the ones with shadow, which are obviously totally very different. What's being communicated there. The part of what made this set for me so eye catching is that the art and style is so dramatically different from Mirage block. It is way different from the set Mirage for sure. Mm -hmm. And also pretty tonally and just visually different from Weatherlight, Mm -hmm. right? So this being the next thing, one of the things that's always stood out to me about the Tempest Lands is uh, you said brutalistic. It just looks aggressive. Like it's aggressively different than what we've seen before. Yeah, it's not just that it's desolate. Yeah. It looks like the the land is actively violent. Yes. It it is a very powerful image. Uh, Tempest was the last set that was marketed as a standalone set. Now, of course, if you remember, you've been with us for other episodes. Plenty of other sets have been marketed as standalone sets. We weren't really doing the whole block thing in a meaningful way. The best attempt at that, I guess, would say is Mirage Block, but there was some connectivity issues there, in my opinion. Mostly that Weatherlight was part of Mirage Block, but not really. So uh, this is the last set that was marketed as a standalone set and the first set that was advertised as an expert level set in the new rating system for sets. Now, hang on. Where did I put that booster pack? Is it on here? Say expert level on here anywhere? I think it might have been on the starter decks. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to flip up this label. All right. Yeah. So not on the booster pack could be on the booster box Box. potentially, but not on an individual pack, which is fine. Uh, now let's talk about this rating system they introduced here. This rating system was introduced with fifth edition Tempest and portal second age, a set. I know actual nothing about, by the way, I know very close to nothing. about. I know portal and I know portal three kingdoms, right? I know nothing about second age. Uh, these ratings stopped appearing on packaging with the release of Lorwyn in 2007. But let's talk about the different types of ratings here. They had starter level sets, sets designed to have the lowest possible level of magic complexity. They were meant to do, excuse me, they were meant to introduce and teach the players to perspective and new players. So it was meant to have players use this to teach new players. Yeah. Okay. Uh, They were discontinued as they did not fulfill this purpose. Sure. But similar products have since been printed in the form of two player starter sets and more recently as spell slinger starter kits. So basically a starter level set is what portal tried to do. Yeah. I don't think it's great to design a product that the goal is ostensibly this is for experienced players to teach their friends. Yeah. But no one would ever use this to teach their friends. Correct. You would just slowly walk them through the actual rules of the game. Yeah. I would agree with that. Then we had advanced level sets. Uh, These were the core sets of the game. They had a medium level of complexity intended to include what are today known as evergreen mechanics like mill, scry, exile, stuff that's evergreen nowadays. I think scry is the best example of that. Um, Basically like M10. The core creature keywords is another part of that. Some of them are absent from portal, but you start saying things like first strike, trample. You get introduced to the well, flying appears in portal. Okay. Okay. But you're like, you're starting to look at the nuts and bolts. Like these are creature keywords that appear in every set. They're universal. They're defining the color pie and that you get introduced in the advanced sets as well. Then we have expert level sets. 
Uh, these were sets that were generally of the highest level of magic thematically and mechanically, and they had some complexity to them. Expert level sets were all expansion sets, like your Tempest, like your Weather Lights, basically, you know, just whatever you think uh, expansion is, that was an expert level set. Right. So you have Portal, you have Core Sets, and you have everything else. There you go. That's pretty much how it got delineated. So that's your kind of breakdown of the rating system, which again, got integrated with 5th edition Tempest and Portal 2nd Age, and then went bye-bye when Lorwyn came around in 2007. Let's talk about how Tempest was sold. You already saw the booster packs earlier, so we'll start there. It was sold in three ways. Booster packs is number one. Booster pack contained a rare, three uncommons, and 11 commons. Now, uh, the packs, which we stumbled and fumbled on this in the intro, uh, they were featured artwork from Oratog. Mm-hmm. Yours was Volrath's Curse. Volrath's Curse, an and, iconic card. Sure. <laughs> uh, and mine was Commander Griven Ilvec. So three different artworks. Okay, fair enough. There were also some 60 card starter decks. That's the second way that they were sold. And then the third way they were sold were four pre constructed theme decks. So using only Tempest cards, the design team built four theme decks marketed as a ready to play introduction to the set. The booklet that came with each deck explained the play strategy for each deck and suggested ways to strengthen them by swapping in cards from other sets. So, before I go over the four deck list, is it weird to have a booklet to tell you, like, here's how to make your deck better? Not necessarily. No? Okay. Yeah, I I mean, I don't know if I would put it in terms that explicit, but a, a little bit of... Here are some next steps or cards to consider or things that interact well with what you're already doing. I think that's fine. Okay. All right. For some reason, it kind of felt a little weird to me. I kind of want the thing to stand on its own. I guess. I th- I still think there's some amount of, we're not trying to give you a completed deck. We're trying to give you a taste of the experience. If we give you a bunch of different cards, you'll just find your favorites. And if you want to build around those, that's great. Okay. And the more options we give you the more likely it is you find something that you really really like okay fair enough so i don't really mind it for whatever it's worth uh i started working in a card shop not during tempest but a little bit after the fact and these sort of decks went on for a very long time they were very popular in a certain way Mm -hmm. we always had them in stock when the notice that came out they sold really well but do you know what the problem is Hmm. You're a product guy. Think about it. The problem with pre-cons. Sold. You buy them in a case of 12, and each case has three copies of one of the four decks. Okay. So you get three of deck A, three of deck B, three of deck C, and so on. What, does one one just always sell better than the others? One always sells better than the others. Okay. Because... A lot of it, it's just about the rares, pretty much. I think the betrayers of Kamigawa one had Umazawa's Jite in it. I was a huge, positive that was true. It was a huge issue. Yeah. So as a retailer, the spot that you're in is either you have to charge way more for one of the decks, mm. or you just sit there with two or three of the decks rotting on the shelf, and you can't reorder until you go through Get those. rid of everything else. Okay. So okay. in a lot of ways, it's a very cool product, but. As a paper product, it's a little bit trouble to sell the way that it was sold. Okay. Uh, Let's go over the four decks real quick. The deck lists are going to magically appear on the screen for our wonderful wonderful editor, John. The first deck is Deep Freeze. It's a white-blue deck. And the three rares in the deck are Avenging Angel, A Messy Tome, and Precognition. Next up is The Slivers. It's a blue-black deck. I wonder what it's based around. Uh, the three rares in the deck are Fevered Convulsions, Air Ties Meddling, and Extinction. None of those are slivers. <laughs> Good job by you, partner. No problem. Well done. Next up is The Swarm. And when I think swarm, I think white green, mm-hmm. which is what this deck is. The three rares in this deck are Elven Warhounds, Recycle, and the Lurin. Recycle is not a card I would put in front of new players. I wouldn't put a Lurin or Recycle in front of a new player. Recycle might be the easiest card in Magic to lock yourself out of the game with. <laughs> that's true. That's, true. Is, that's like a that's if if I I don't think you're supposed to do 
the beginner intermediate expert thing. But if there's an expert level card, it is recycled. It is recycled yeah. It's like, do not try this at home. Yeah, that's true. You need to watch someone do this. <laughs> right. Uh, and then the fourth deck is the Flames of Wrath. It is a white red deck. And the three rares in this one are Furnace of Wrath. Great. Magmasaur. Sick. And Saltari Gorillas. <laughs> Naive shadow, little Boro shadow action. That's right, like that. Yeah, okay, boy. so there's your four precons. Some of them were probably well, one of them was I'm sure more popular than the others. Uh, and then Tempest has some fun ancillary products that we bought off of eBay. So the first one is yeah. look at this little humdinger. It's small, you can't see it. And normally the other camera would be over here to zoom in on. But we don't have it today, so deal with it. I'm sure our editor can bring this up on the screen. Enhance. 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 Just print the damn thing. This is the Tempest rulebook, but it was called the Tempest storybook, and it was different than previous rulebooks. Now, I may have told this story before on this show, but before I went to my first competitive magic tournament, I read, I think, the Ice Age rulebook. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted to make sure I knew how the rules were. I didn't want to go to my local card shop, which then way back when was ground zero comics. There was like a, there was like a, like a $10 vintage tournament. Mm -hmm. And I rolled up with some rogue elephants among, and some, and some land destruction. I almost won a match, which was really cool. And everyone was really nice to me. I have, uh, the, the set is a really fun part of my competitive arc okay because at this point i was living uh, you know hillsborough new jersey various card shops they pop up they go out of business you know whatever but i basically stayed in town okay tempest marks the time where myself and my crew went out of town to go to another store Ooh. the store was called boyhood dreams wouldn't want to call it that nowadays, yeah. but that's what it was. That's what it was called. The boy of dreams in Denellen, New Jersey, about 20 minutes away from where I lived. Okay. So, uh, they had like a really packed Friday night seat. Okay. Cause it's still pre FNM. Okay. But it's Friday night. Everyone's playing standard. There's vintage games going on. People busting packs, 30, 35 people in the shop, which is big at the time. Yep. Hey, that's big now. Big now. Yeah. And I learned a very valuable lesson. First of all, it was the first store that I went to where the I I, I was not in the top 50 percent of the room playing in tournaments. OK, so I learned a lot just in terms of taking lumps or whatever. OK, OK. But I also learned something really value about multiplayer etiquette. So we were playing. I You would call it, I guess, a commander game now, but it was a table of like 16 people. I call it back then. I'd call it like free for all. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But we're just going around in a circle. Okay. All right. Okay. You know, and it's a casual crowd and I got a nice deck, some power in it, you know, whatever. Oh, wow. Look at you. And I'm like, I'm just going to rinse these people. Okay. So <laughs> I play on the second or the third turn, the abyss. Oh, which pretty good in a multiplayer setting not bad and i make uh -huh. some comment to one of my friends who's not playing but watching mm -hmm. about like uh i'm just gonna i'm gonna wipe the floor with these people do you see what i'm doing right here i did not get another turn did they all kill you i was dead <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well before we got back to my turn so you know 16 year old me learned some pretty valuable lessons about table etiquette and the nature of politics and multiplayer magic. Take your abyss and get the hell out of here. Oh yeah. I, it did, it, I didn't even get close to getting back to my turn. There was like three or four other people who got to go before I was even up. Dude. Nice. Yeah. Really nice. Just everywhere, you know, just a bunch of fireballs for four. <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, they handled it. You. Yeah. They handled it. You. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, okay. Get out of here. Got dude, hit guy. by a juggernaut. Oh, that's yeah, tough. All of it. That's all tough. of it. Has, I took it all. Has to attack. Has to. It's the rules. <laughs> so more about this Tempest storybook. Um, anyone buying Tempest cards could safely be assumed to have either a fifth edition rule book or a friend who could teach them the game. Not sure that's true. Mm -hmm. So instead of reprinting all the rules in the Tempest rulebook, Wizards of the Coast only printed a brief overview and a few pages describing the features that were new in the set. The rest of the booklet, some 50 pages, profiled the main characters and summarized the Tempest story. So 
this is small. Me leafing through it right now is not going to be particularly helpful for you. Maybe there's some screenshots. Maybe there's not. I don't know. I won't be able to tell you that until I look at the edited product. But here's what I can tell you. I can open a page one of this little book. The contents, rules, summary, and new features of Tempest, page one. The story of Tempest, page 10, which means that's not a lot of room for the rules. And also, the book's small, not a lot of room for text. Game support, page 62, a lot of room for the story. I do think this is a huge step in the right direction. Okay. Um, Even if you don't grant the assumption that anyone buying this either already knows the rules or has a friend that's going to teach them, Mm -hmm. the rule books are worse than useless. I would agree. So you might as well just tell the story. That's at least something fun and engaging. That's actually something you can show your friend and say, hey, check out this game. It's not just a card game. There's a whole world being built. they got characters and stuff. And- to the extent that you want to talk about the rules, I think the best thing to do is say, here's the new stuff. You're not familiar with it. Maybe you run into a card with a, a keyword on it and it's not reminder text because of its rarity or whatever the case may be. Uh, so get yourself ready for buyback and shadow and here's how it works. Great. Massive step in the right direction. Now I've got a little fun thing here in the middle of the booklet. It's on page uh, 31. There's a little something you can pull out of here and mail. Mm-hmm. I don't really know what you'd call this. It's like a questionnaire. Customer service. Yeah. Let me see this thing. So go ahead. You can go Customer and take feedback. A look. Yeah, there you go. So you can go and you want to read some of those questions. Okay. Here are some questions. <clears throat> Wizard's very interested. How much do you spend on all games in a typical month? And then in parentheses, specify currency. Okay. Uh, I'm going to 100 USD. How much do you spend on magic in a typical month? Specify currency. 75 USD. Age. Then or now? Uh, Whatever. Okay. Uh, then uh, this came out in 97. 11. Uh, gender, male, female. Male. A little antiquated. Yep. Uh, full name, street, city, state, zip code, phone, country, and interestingly enough, email address. Which was not the most common thing at the time. Wow. Okay. So uh, no email address for me. Didn't have a home computer then. Rest of the stuff I would willingly answer. Not okay. On, not on this show. Tell us what you think of Tempest and you might win a display box of Tempest boosters. Ooh. It's exciting. Okay. So you can rate the following characteristics from excellent to poor. Okay. Overall quality, artwork, story slash flavor text, expansion name, expansion symbol, collectability, fun to play, innovative play, Packaging, power of cards. There is a sliding scale of complexity ranging from too complex to too simple. Uh, Would you prefer that a standalone expansion include a storybook or a standard rule book? Answer either. Okay. Uh, Subset, did you read the storybook? Uh, If yes, how would you rate the storybook for overall quality, rules overview, Artwork slash layout story, interesting to read, collectability, all rated excellent to poor. How did you learn to play Magic the Gathering? Uh, self-taught, learn from friend, a friend family, learn from retailer, learn at event slash demonstration. Have you purchased any Tempest pre-constructed decks? Have you yes. purchased por- Portal? Have you purchased 5th Edition? What expansion for Magic the Gathering is your favorite? What type of player are you primarily? Check one, either social slash casual or competitive. In which of the following events do you participate? Standard tournaments, classic tournaments, classic restricted tournaments, arena league. Which type of games do you like to play? Which one is your favorite? Trading card games, computer slash CD-ROM games, online computer games, console video games, arcade games, board games. Party games, Pictionary, etc. Role-playing games, uh, and lastly, traditional card games, Bridge, etc. Okay. Surprisingly not the most antiquated. That was actually pretty good. That was not that I bad think. for the time. Yeah, that was actually pretty good. Like, you can get some, you can get some useful information from this. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like doing market research. Yeah. Yeah. That was actually, and you know, I do, I am curious about what the uh, display box of Tempest Boosters looks like. If I win one of those. Yeah, but. maybe they haven't drawn it yet. Let's just send it in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Probably well, that's a little side project. Probably send this in after the show. Yeah. 
Uh, I read the story. We'll get to that in the lore portion of the episode. There's one more fact to go over here, folks. Uh, and it is a Tempest had an official guide called the official guide to Tempest. A little bigger. Boom. Uh, this this official guide uh, was a complete companion to the Tempest card set written by Beth Morsund. Hope I got your last name right, Beth. Magic's second rules manager. It was released in 1997, just like Tempest. And the guide gives tips for playing in a Tempest-only environment and how to best use Tempest cards with 5th edition. There are full-color reproductions of all the Tempest cards along with information on the rarity of the cards and current errata. Yeah, so full visual spoiler. That's awesome. Love that. Uh, Okay. Uh, I have opened up to a random page. Okay. Whispers of the Muse. Oh, that's a good card. One of the best Tempest cards for slow decks. If you draw it early, just toss it away for another draw. Late in a duel, use it with buyback at the end of your opponent's turn whenever you have leftover mana. Unlike va- the various tomes, uh, it can only be stopped by counterspells. Winged Sliver. One of the best slivers. A cloud of flying slivers is far more dangerous than a herd of walking, and then in parentheses, slithering? Question mark. Slivering? Question mark. Once. Uh, all right. Time Warp. Another good one here. Last one. As a fixed version of Time Walk, Time Warp will probably be one of the most wanted cards in Tempest. Its high casting cost and double blue make it fairly balanced, though. Who's to say that's true? It's too expensive for fast decks. Wrap this up. I swear I didn't look at this before I started reading it. That was just an opening. It It works well in permission plus big creature strategies and gives you extra cards with Howling Mind. Last bit's actually kind of useful. Okay. That's Balanced. Uh, Balanced, huh? This this book costs sixteen ninety five. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I don't know if that's a lot or a little then. Oh, it's like a good thirty dollars in today's dollars. Not cheap. Yeah. But it's cool. And the fact that it shows you the rarities is super valuable. I think that's actually super cool. And just a, like clearly some time and effort was put into this. Mm-hmm. So as an adjoining product, I think it's actually pretty rad. Yeah, this is sweet. Yeah. So Tempest did some pretty cool things with uh, ancillary products in the Tempest rulebook and the official guide to Tempest. Um, those are the facts of Tempest. So we hope you learned some things there, like uh, about the pre-release card Dirt Cow Worm mm-hmm. and who the set was designed and developed by. Now you're going to learn even more after a short break because we are going into the lore section. And I spent so much time on this <laughs> that if you even think about skipping it, I'm going to be so disappointed in you. BRB. All right, everybody, we are back for the lore of Tempest. Now, if you were with us in our Weatherlight episode, you know that Weatherlight had some weird things going on with the story Mm -hmm. because it introduced some of the key characters in Tempest Block and Wrath Cycle, like Gerard and friends, but was part of Mirage Block even though the Weatherlight story has nothing to do with Mirage Block. So it's just a little, I'm going to use the term disjointed. It's not how one would typically choose to tell a story. Yeah. Okay. So when all my old buddy Patrick here, I requested for him to purchase the Tempest storybook off of eBay. And then, you know, we got it. And I sat in bed one night and I read the whole story. And I will say, it's like kind of interesting. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. Now I, I I have heard and have read online that like as the the wrath cycle and the I guess I think it's called the weatherlight saga. Like as it goes, it gets worse and doesn't like it's not particularly coherent. But to start, it's pretty good. So what did I do? I took a lot of notes here from this here little bookie bookie wookie, and I wrote them down in my script here. So let's start with the prologue. Uh, Patrick doesn't know. I mean, you might know some of this stuff. I but. I basically know some of the protagonists and the the big bad and some of the minions. Yeah. But not really how they interact with one another. All right. So here's the prologue. Sisse, captain of the flying ship Weatherlight, was kidnapped by Volrath. Edmund Carr. Is that how you say that? Um, yeah. Is that Evan, how you said it? Evan Carr. Evan Carr. 
of the Shadow Plane Wrath, which is obviously where Tempest is. The Weatherlight crew sought out Gerard, heir to a collection of artifacts called the Legacy, to lead them to Wrath to rescue their abducted leader, who again is Sisse. The crew doesn't know that Stark, a native of Wrath, betrayed Sisse to Volrath in hope of freeing his daughter from Volrath's grasp. Some scheming here. Once aboard the Weatherlight, Gerard led the ship across Dominaria to enlist the rest of the crew needed to reach Wrath. From the wilds of Llanowar Forest came Gerard's old friend Miri, a cat warrior. A detour to the time-shifting Isle of, Tal- of Talaria brought Airtai, a young wizard, to the crew. In Urborg, the nobleman Krovax joined the ranks. After adding these vital members, Gerard and the rest of the Weatherlight crew learned that in order for the Weatherlight to successfully travel to Wrath, they needed help from someone who knew Wrath, Stark. Because of course, Gerard and the Weatherlight crew found the treacherous Stark and saved him from Volrath's mercenary warlord, Maraxis, from Mm -hmm. Weatherlight. Yes. Of Keld, the muscular buff dude in that set. Still harboring the secret of Sisei's betrayal, Stark joined the Weatherlight crew. The flying ship then began the plane shift to Wrath. That's how they travel, uh, where Sisei and Volrath await them. Tempest begins as the Weatherlight arrives in Wrath, headed to its confrontation with the forces of Volrath. Cool. All right. So we've identi- we, we, we have identified some characters. Sisei has been captured. Volrath is your big bad. Uh, Stark is obviously up to no good, but is invested because he wants to free his daughter from Volrath. And then Gerard is our, uh, was that our protagonist? That's our conquering hero. Yeah, I guess. Basically, it, it is sort of, it is something of a flat, a more flat hierarchy. Sure. Like their crew of the ship, everyone's got kind of their own powers sort of deal. All right. So now I've listed, I've done the prologue. Now here are the heroes and villains. We're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to read about each one and I'm going to let you comment on if you think they're lame, if you think they're cool, whatever. So Gerard, Gerard captains the Weatherlight on its mission to Volrath's Citadel in the shadow plane of wrath. Once a master of arms in Benalia, Gerard could be Dominaria's last hope. He is heir to the legacy, a collection of artifacts that has the power to stop the Evan cars and the one they serve the Lord of the wastes. Do you know who that is? Hmm. No. Yogmoth. Ah. But is only referred to as Lord of the Waste in the text. Gerard is unaware that the journey to rescue his friends to say will involve him in a conflict spanning the plains. He will soon find himself confronted by lost kin, strengthening foes, and the great secret of wrath. Not into it. Seems kind of boring. Just like born into a, a lot of privilege and is blissfully unaware of What's really going on? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pretty, a little corny. Now, here's what I'm also going to say, even though we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, if Gerard's such a big deal, why isn't there like a meaningful card around him ever? Uh, well, there was one card that showed up a little bit in tournament play. Is there? Gerard's Wisdom from Weatherlight. Okay. Well, okay. So, yes to like... An instant or sorcery. Like Gerard's wisdom, I know showed up. Gerard's verdict. Yep. White black discard card. Like mm-hmm. that card showed up a little bit. But like nowadays, they would make Gerard into like a legendary creature that's good or a planeswalker or something. Yeah. And make sure that it wouldn't be like overwhelmingly powerful, ideally, but it's like, yo, Gerard's here. Too boring. Yeah. There's no personality here. Okay. All right. Uh let's talk about the weather light. Perhaps the most unusual legacy artifact, the Weatherlight, is a flying ship with the ability to plane shift. It's a vessel in both senses of the word. It houses a legacy and can sail across the plains to reach its lost elements. Sisse once bestowed the Weatherlight on Gerard, heir to the legacy, but he refused to accept it. Sisse's recent abduction by Volrath has compelled him to lead the ship and its crew to her rescue. Cool. Ships are cool. Yeah. A, a little steampunky. Yeah. It's a sweet. Cool. Yeah. Uh, the legacy, for those of you not in the know, is a reference to legacy weapon. Yes. But the legacy is a collection of a bunch of stuff, uh, including the weatherlight. All right. Let's meet our big bad, Volrath. Volrath, Evan Carr of Wrath, serves the Lord of the Waste, who we've established as Yogmoth, the embodiment of evil. They're speaking of the Lord of the Waste there. Gerard does not yet know that Volrath was Vul, V-U-E-L, son of the Siddhar who raised Gerard. Vul and Gerard were friends as children 
of the War Clan. Over time, Vool grew ambitious and eventually waged war against and destroyed the War Clan, then disappeared to Wrath. Now, reborn as Volrath, he rules the plain from his mountain stronghold. Though Volrath has achieved great power for the Lord of the Waste, his own goals are as dark as his master's. His hatred for Gerard and his desire to possess the legacy led him to kidnap Sisei in hopes of turning his former blood brother to Wrath. I think that's a pretty cool foundation. It's a little bit too close to the Baron Singur story okay. for my, you know, it's not that far removed and whatever. Okay. But as a story, as setting aside that context, I think that's cool. Sure. All right. Evan Cars. They're powerful evil beings who serve the Lord of the Waste. They implement the Lord's plans, often while believing that they act independently. Becoming an Evancar often begins when one attracts the attention of the Lord of the Waste by bringing about the destruction of his or her own community. Through complex machinations, the Lord of the Waste then manipulates that person into serving him in a greater war to come. Uh, very cool. It's nice to have kind of a medium bad. Okay. Sort of a general grievous start of character. Okay. Um yep. And it's also because they are kind of pitted against one another to some respect, they are kind of battling over the same space. It does give you the opportunity to have a story beat where now two of them are in conflict with one another or one of them turns on whatever. So, yeah, nice, good storytelling there. Hannah. Educated in artifact studies at the Argivian University, Hannah is a voice of wisdom aboard the Weatherlight. Her characteristic reserve comes from grappling with two strained relationships. She barely speaks to her father, Baron, magic card, and she still feels hurt by Gerard's unexpected abandonment of their romance years ago. Despite Hannah's reticence, her role as ship's navigator and her knowledge of artifacts often put her at the front of the action. Uh, awful. <laughs> It's like you have this character that's defined in totality by their strained relationship with two men. Next. <laughs> All right, moving on. Miri. <laughs> the cat warrior Miri, abandoned by her kind during her youth, struggles to find a secure place in the world. This search leads her to join her best friends, Gerard, on the journey to wrath. She is an excellent fighter, powerful, dexterous, and quick. And though neither she nor Gerard admits it, she unofficially serves as the Weatherlight's first mate. In all the years since they've trained under the Morrow sorcerer Multani, Miri has never let Gerard down. Sure. Cool. Teammate. Yeah, teammate. Cat warrior. Reliable. Like that. Yeah. Like that. Griven Ilvec. Greven. I'm going to go with Greven. Greven, an outcast from Vec society, commands Volrath's flying ship, the Predator predator flagship oh yeah oh yeah that thing was a dealer the dealer it was like unbeatable unlimited it was pretty tough, <laughs> pretty tough. i don't know i don't know of anyone who played through it <laughs> sure, okay it got okay. blown up sometimes but i never saw anyone play it out uh although he is a savage combatant greven restrains himself when in Volras' presence. His hatred and fear of the Edmund results from the horrific artificial spine Volrath implanted in Greven to both enhance and control him. Now Greven waits for his opportunity to retaliate, hoping to destroy Volrath and take his place as Edmund Carr of Wrath. So this is what you talked about, where like there's some internal conflict between the bad guys. Yeah, that's sweet. Okay. Uh, the Predator. Volrath's warship. <laughs> it ships so much cooler than the Weatherlight. Uh, the Predator is a flying ship like the Weatherlight, but the resemblance ends there. Whereas the Weatherlight is an elegant schooner, the Predator, clearly of ancient Phyrexian design, is a claw-shipped iron galoon. Although the uh, Predator lacks the Weatherlight's most important ability, plane shifting, it compensates with unmatched firepower and near indestructibility. At its helm is Volrath's enforcer, Griven and Ilvac, whose dark, towering form echoes the Predator's. This is not an uncommon sort of story beat in a handful of properties. If you yeah. look at um, the Death Star in Star Wars versus the Rebel Fleet. Okay. If you look at the USS Enterprise versus the Borg Cube, there is the notion of they're both sharing the same space. The good guys are much more oriented around being able to travel quickly and elusively. And the uh, bad guys are in a machine of death. <laughs> sure that's, that's actually true yeah there's a there, this is not an uncommon beat uh tangarth uh tangarth a Talrum minotaur frequently lets his blades speak for him and it speaks quickly 
gruff and impatient, Tangarth serves to say as a loyal first mate, but now, as the weather light races across Wrath, he faces both the pressure of rescuing his captain and friends to say, and that of trusting his new captain, Gerard. His vanity is not a Talrum trait, but a personal one. Sure. Well, uh, some analogs to Worf there, you know, it's like a, comes from a race of combatants. Okay. You know, kind of got his own thing going on. He's, to a he's the muscle? Yeah, sure. The team? Okay. All right. Karn. Uh, Karn, a silver golem, is haunted by the memory of killing an innocent bystander in a sudden burst of anger, and he has vowed that he will never take another life. Long ago, he served as guardian of both Gerard and the legacy. He failed at both when Gerard's blood brother, Vuel, stole much of the legacy and deactivated him. Karn's bond to Gerard and the weatherlight cannot be broken, though he is a living, thinking piece of the legacy. So I have a thought here. Is it about the weirdness of a of a non violence pack from a robot? That's one piece of it. Okay. So I know you didn't watch much Marvel like uh-huh. movies or anything. So this is, and I know this, may, like technically came first before Marvel did all the movies and everything. It's just kind of Vision. It's a little bit. I mean, Vision in the comic books well predates, uh, like this card. Yeah. Yeah, I think Vision in Marvel. Like was came out in the 1960s. I okay. Think. So in the movies, um, you know, like Vision has a one of the stone one of the stones yeah. for the Infinity Gauntlet. So you know they're just like, hey, and I I think Vision's goal was to not be violent and just like I'm part of the team and everything. But like you know, uh, in the same way that Karn is a piece of the legacy weapon, Vision was a uh, a stone for the Infinity Gauntlet for Thanos. Sure. Yeah. I don't know if that I don't know if like those I like whoever wrote this. Was trying to do that well it's a pretty it, i mean again it's a it, it there's something cool foundationally about you have this uh thing that's ostensibly inanimate that you are trying to protect yeah but one of the characters gives that that thing actually an element of life to it okay that's cool all right i just think the non-violent pact if you're a robot it's a little a little weird why do you care yeah sure sure just do what you're gonna do yeah Beep boop. Uh, <laughs> Selenia. Once the guardian angel of Krovax and his noble family, Selenia is now under Volras' full control. Created from both black and white magic, Selenia's purpose is unclear. Her very existence seems to push Krovax towards darkness. She possesses a spiritual link to Krovax that gives her a rough sense of his location, state of mind, and intent. She uses this link to lead Volrath's ship, the Predator, to the weatherlight as Gerard and his crew arrive in Wrath. Sweet. Yeah, cool. That's a nice ancillary character. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up is Krovax. Once part of the Weatherlight crew, Krovax endured a tremendous tragedy. After his angelic guardian, Selenia, disappeared, some of his noble family was murdered by Volrath's force. Krovax began to brood and lash out, acting on strange emotions. When he left his home in Urborg, vulnerable to search for his beloved Selenia, Krovax inadvertently destroyed what remained of his family. Now, bent on revenge and seeking and still seeking the angel, he has rejoined the Weatherlight crew. Little odd. Okay. Lashing out with weird emotions. Yeah. It's like your family died. Yeah. Those emotions that seem. Yeah. That's not, not very easy to identify. <laughs> sure. <laughs> those seem like extremely valid emotions. Right. Okay. Uh, so he's kind of tied to Selenia, the angel, uh, and whatever she's up to. And then he's part of the Weatherlight crew, but sounds like he has some ulterior motives. Yeah. Okay. Orem of Orem's chant theme. Orm's reassuring presence aboard the Weatherlight serves several purposes. She is the spiritual center of the Weatherlight crew. She is a skilled Samite healer, and she is the voice of understanding, both because she is calm and caring and because she speaks many languages. Though she is very giving, Orm keeps many of her views to herself, believing that there is peace and silence. This is another uh, extremely gender conforming. Yeah. This character is exactly what you think this character would be right? when it was written at this time. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I kind of do stuff. I'm the healer on the team. Nobody's favorite. Yeah. I know everything, but I think it's a bad idea for me to talk. Pretty, Yeah. We got to let Gerard. He's got to figure it out for himself. This clown. Yeah. <laughs> He's got to do it all. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Airtie. This is another very stereotypical character. As an apprentice of Hana's father, Baron. <laughs> Hannah's father brand, excuse me. Airtai learned a great deal of magic. His skills, however, are completely untried. 
Uh, when Gerard suggested that he join the Weatherlight crew to help them reach Wrath, Airtai quickly agreed. But now the arrogant young man is called on to display his prowess time and time again. And though Airtai secretly suspects he may not know quite as much as he thought he did, his pride will never let him admit <laughs> it to his comrades. Oh, oh, the young hotshot. Yeah. So we got we got Orem knows everything, doesn't talk, <laughs> and then we have Airtai knows nothing. Talks and acts constantly. Yeah, can't, can't stop talking. Can't stop talking. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. <laughs> Next up, Squee. Or as I call it, uh, from Guardians of the Galaxy, Rocket Raccoon. Mm -hmm. An intellectual giant for a goblin, Squee's natural curiosity balances his natural cowardice. He is welcomed. He was welcomed aboard as a cabin hand under both Sisse and Gerard, though his loyalty seems to tie more with Sisse. Given that he is a goblin, Squee has an unusual knack for survival. Yeah. You know why uh, more connected with Sisse? Why is that? Because Squee's really smart. That's true. And those Gerard's a loser. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to bet on the wrong horse? No way. He's a survivalist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even if he is a stupid goblin. Squee knows a loser when he sees yeah. one. This is no, <laughs> no doubt about it. Uh, last character is Stark. As the Weatherlight journeys to Volrest Stronghold, Stark seems allied with Gerard. This allegiance could easily change, though, before Sisse is rescued. Stark, a former servant of Volrath and possibly of the forces behind the Evencar, is driven by self-preservation and his own hidden agenda. In truth, he betrayed Sisse to Volrath, a fact not yet known by the Weatherlight crew. Gerard's pledge to rescue Stark's daughter from Volrath seems to have earned his loyalty, but for Stark, loyalty is a tricky concept. That sounds like it. it's not really it's just he's not loyal he's not loyal that's that's pretty much all it is i think sure yeah. but fine once they save his daughter he's just gonna throw these guys under there him. there's a lot of you can squeeze a lot of juice out of you know duplicitous character trying to play both sides of the fence at the same time okay sure so now here's a synopsis of what i read in the book Three paragraphs for you folks. The Weatherlight arrives in Wrath to rescue Captain Sisse when Volrath's ship, the Predator, attacks. Volrath's forces, led by the Dark Angel Selenia, swarm the ship looking for legacy artifacts, one of which is Karn. Captain Gerard falls overboard into the forest of Sky Shroud below. Useless. <laughs> In an act of nonviolence, Karn gives himself up and is taken aboard the Predator. All the remaining artifacts are taken by Volrath except Squee's toy. Tangarth leaps onto the fleeing predator and later finds Karn. Griven Ilvek intervenes against Tangarth and takes him prisoner. Meanwhile, Gerard flees the merfolk and finds himself in the company of the Vec on a pilgrimage. Their leader, the Oracle, I believe there's a card called Oracle on Vec. That sounds right. Yeah. Uh, believes Gerard is a prophesized hero. The <sighs> court, yep, you, there it is. The Corvac Dell. Uh, the remaining crew of the Weatherlight descends into the Sky Shroud Forest for repairs, and Hannah and Miri set out on foot to find Gerard. The Sky Shroud Elves capture them and bring them before their elven lord, Aladamri, who happened to receive the Vec and Gerard into his company. Isn't that convenient? Uh, Gerard explains his mission and convinces Aladamri to free Hannah and Miri. Gerard then discusses the plan to reach Volrath's stronghold with Aladamri, Stark, and the Oracle on Vec. I finally figured out who Gerard is. He's Captain America. Took me a minute. Well, there's also the uh, this absolute oaf. <laughs> this 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 complete head to toe Dingleberry just just crashes crashes because he forgot to put gas in the ship before he left, <laughs> and he lands. Uh, in front of this, you know, sort of indigenous tribe, mysticism, indigenous tribe. Yeah. And they're all just like, oh, yeah, that's got to be God. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, yeah, that's right. That's ex you got it. Exactly. Exactly. Uses uses them basically to uh, uh, as as like just material for his invasion. Yeah. Just keep going. You guys trust me. You're right. I am the yeah, one. Yeah, you're totally right. I'm the what, one. Yeah. You all got so lucky <laughs> <laughs> that I just fell <laughs> out of the from the sky oh. and I'm here. Uh, the Predator returns to Volrath's stronghold, which one, that's a card. Two, that's the name of the next set. 
I didn't know that Stronghold was named after Volrath Stronghold. That I that I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know yeah. that when I was growing up. Uh, where Volrath is displeased with Grevenil Vec uh, and his inability to capture Gerard and uses his dark magic, dark magic, excuse me, to torture him. Karn and Tangarth are imprisoned in Volrath's torture chamber on the Weatherlight. Aladamri provides the crew with directions to a portal that could help them escape wrath. Perhaps it's an erratic one. Mm-hmm. Airtai leaves the ship to interpret the portal's runes and to prepare it for use when the weatherlight returns from the stronghold. Airtai is confronted by the Sol- uh, Sultari emissary Lina, L-Y-N-A, maybe that's Lina, and is drawn into her world full of beings caught between wrath and Dominaria, shadow. Uh, in return, Airtai draws Lina into his reality on wrath, and they begin discussing the plight of the Saltari and Lina's interest in the portal. Okay, little side plot. Airtai talking about something he has no idea. He has about, no clue. No clue yeah, about. No clue. But he's yeah, I totally magic. read the instructions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is how the portal works. Just trust me. Yeah, on the weatherlight, and you're definitely going to go when you go in the portal. It's definitely going to take you to the place I say, and not somewhere else. Right. On the weatherlight, Krovax feels Selenia en route to the stronghold because they have some sort of bond. Uh, the crew travels to the Cinder Marsh and encounters a massive layer of sliver creatures that share a hive mind. With Hannah's help, they defeat the slivers and continue through the back door entrance to the stronghold via the ventilation ducts that lead to the Furnace of Wrath. One, how big is this ship? Two, how big is this stronghold? Three, how big is the Furnace of Wrath? Well, I mean, the artwork on Furnace of Wrath gives you some sense of scale. Like pretty it's big. massive. Yeah. Must be huge. Yeah. Okay. Uh, after fighting the fires of the furnace, they travel to the death pits and are boarded by monsters called Carionettes. With the blessing of Orum, the Samite healer, Gerard destroys them and escapes below deck, but not before saving Squee from Carionet reinforcements. Squee then activates his toy. Mm-hmm. More to come. In future episodes of the Receivables. All right. So what do you think of this story? I mean, I do appreciate sort of the multi-tiered. It's not just the act of getting to the big bad guy and fighting. Yeah. There's this whole process that goes along, some of which is natural, some of which is unnatural, some of which in the case of the slivers is kind of ambiguous, maybe yeah. kind of a blend of both. Yep. So I think that the... the the wrath and the Volrath stronghold sort of story beat is pretty sweet. I think they're trying to do a lot. Maybe one could argue too much because there's a lot of characters. There's some introduction of some weird stuff like the Sultari, the Carionettes, and the Slivers. But you know what? They're trying some stuff. All right. So whatever. Anyway, uh, that's the most lore we've ever brought you on this show. And you know what? I think we did pretty good. <laughs> that's what I'm going to say. So uh, we're going to take a break from the lore. And we're going to move on to the mechanics of Tempest. Spoiler, they're both really bad right after this. All right, everybody, it is now time to go over the mechanics of Tempest. I hope you enjoyed that lore portion, by the way. Uh, Tempest introduced two new mechanics, buyback and shadow. We're going to start with buyback. Okay. A keyword ability that appears on instants and sorceries that provides an optional additional cost that the player casting the spell with buyback may pay as they cast it. If the player does, as the spell finishes resolving, the spell card is put back into its owner's hand rather than into their graveyard. We have 12 cards with buyback. In white, we have three. Anoint, invulnerability, worthy cause. In blue, we have three. Capsize. Uh, whim of Volrath and Whispers of the Muse. In black, we have four. Corpse Dance, Disturbed Burial, Envencar's Justice, Imp's Taunt. Red has one in Searing Touch. Green has one in Elvish Fury. Uh, person who designs games. Tell me all the positives and negatives of buyback. Uh, I think that both buyback and shadow have the same problem. Okay. Which is as mechanics, they are starting with two strikes, but the specific executions are doing no favors here. Okay. So I'll talk about the designs with buyback that I like for what they are. The red and the green one. Because a few reasons. One is most of the rate is nested in just casting the thing. One mana deal one or one mana plus two plus two. 
that's where most of the strength of the card lies. And in the instance of plus two plus two, there's actually kind of an interesting game there. Like, okay, so you got to play that with buyback. Now I know that you have a pump spell in your hand, and now there's something of a cat and mouse game. In the instance of Searing Touch, okay, this is probably only coming up if the game has gone off the rails somehow. We can't proceed. The the game stalled out, and it's kind of just ending a game that can't end naturally. Not the worst. Okay. Let's compare that to Capsize. (laughs) Sure. Capsize. Okay. So most of the rate is nested in buying it back uh, because three mana boomerang isn't really that much of a deal, but six mana do it for the rest of the game is that's where the, the power level of the card rests is on buying it back. Is there a good cat and mouse game that exists when I play capsize with buyback and then untap and say, go <laughs> not, not particularly. Okay. No. Does capsize help get a game over with that has struggled to resolve on its own. No, it does the opposite. Yeah. It makes that game happen. Yeah. That's the, that's the thing. Yep. So what's nice about buyback is modality is fun and giving people stuff to do with their extra mana is fun. Desirable. Yeah. And there's a lot of mechanics in magic's history and individual designs that lean into that being fun and interesting. Um, you know, like, it's obviously a very different card than cards with buyback, but figure destiny. It's like part of what's fun. There's just stuff going on, stuff to think about kind of playing back and forth. Yeah. There's a lot of ways you can do it. Right. You know, sometimes sweet. you care, sometimes you don't, you can threaten it, but not do it. You are already starting at a huge deficit when the output is play this card potentially for the rest of the game. There are some ways to do it in a way that's dynamic. So for example, in the uh, Elvis Fury example, you play Elvis Fury on a creature and win a combat. Now I know you have Elvis Fury in your hand. If you have a bunch of two twos, now I play a five five. And it's like, well, I didn't answer your Elvis Fury, but it doesn't really play next turn. Okay. Or I untap and I play Wrath of God. It's like, okay, I don't care about it anymore because you don't have any creatures in play. So there are sideways ways of engaging with it that aren't just make them discard it out of their hand or fizzle the target and have the buyback not happen. Okay. But many of the the most powerful designs, you know, particularly in blue and whispers of the muse and capsize are have none of those elements. Once it's on, it's on. It's not really on dimensional turns. There's not really a sideways way to deal with it. It gives the person with the card a combination of inevitability and no incentive to get the game over with yep. and because the cards were not weak at all that stuff actually came up in tournament play capsize is uh it wasn't during my time really but it was a real humdinger. i mean I, I i took a break from magic uh from stronghold like right around the time stronghold got released to urza's legacy so I missed Stronghold, Exodus, Urza Saga. And if you ask me why I quit, it was like cap size was number one on the list. Okay. It's just like at the local store. And I was playing with, you know, Nell, Tuzjins, and Daryl Ors, just four fours for four. That were just, you know, whatever. Yeah. And it, like just couldn't, could not be the cap size. And the game was miserable to play. There's not a lot of, there's not a lot of magic cards that have like terminology around them or like a, like a catchphrase. So mm. as an example, uh, one of them is, uh, end of turn factor fiction you lose yeah right that was a saying back in the day uh another one of them is capsize with buyback yeah and yeah both of those things one are blue and two very powerful right let's talk about shadow uh it's a keyword ability on creatures that serves as both an evasion ability and a blocking restriction there are seven shadow creatures in white four in blue seven in black and one in gold uh, those seven in white are Saltari Crusader, Saltari Emissary, Saltari Foot Soldier, Saltari Lancer, Saltari Monk, Saltari Priest, and Saltari Trooper. In blue, I wonder how you say this one. Thal- Thalakos? Thalakos? I think it's Thalakos. Let's go with Thalakos Dream Sower, Thalakos Mist Folk, Thalakos Seer, and Thalakos Sentry. In black, I know this one. It's Dothy, uh, Dothy Embrace, Dothy Ghoul. Dothy Horror, Dothy Marauder, Dothy Mercenary, Dothy Mind Ripper, and Dothy Slayer. 
And in gold, there is the very powerful and mighty Saltari Gorillas. Talk to me about Shadow before I go over the ways that they had ways to combat Shadow. This is, a, again, very similar in my mind to buyback of starting with two strikes, individual designs, make it worse. The analog here is flying, right? Flying is the sort of the, the variation of this at a baseline level. It is circumstantial unblockability. So you can imagine if 100% of creatures in the game had flying, it's like no one has flying. Mm -hmm. Everyone didn't just block each other. Mm -hmm. If you go down to only one creature in the game has flying, that's unblockable. Assuming that reaches into consideration. Yeah, sure. Because there's not ever another flying creature to block it. So what is the right percentage of creatures to have flying to make it unblockable a lot of the time, but not all the time. I don't know what the number is, but it's certainly not a hundred percent. It's certainly not one somewhere in, in the middle somewhere. Okay. When you're talking about a mechanic that you're not going to be refeaturing, we're just talking about the, it's close to the one case. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the, that interaction is not really going to be coming up very much. And what multiplies how bad it is, is that you can't block. For example, Sarah Angel, flying and vigilance. There are a lot of creature keywords that exist that sort of presuppose that blocking is a possibility. Vigilance, first strike, you name it. Mm -hmm. As the creature approaches unblockable, things like first strike and vigilance no longer work unblockable and can't block yeah, yeah, as sure. long as it's that yep it doesn't work and what is doing it no favors here is that the designs that are powerful are overwhelmingly very cheap efficient attackers it's yeah. just two power you know you could even talk you could talk me into an execution of shadow that was like they were mostly about their activated abilities so they didn't really get into combat much but every once in a while they could you know, a prodigal sorcerer with shadow, let's say. Maybe that's a bad example because it's one power versus one damage, but imagine four mana, two, two prodigal sorcerer with shadow. Okay, sure. You can talk me into that kind of plan. Okay. This is interesting, you know, whatever. But all of them here are just two twos for two. They're just drop down. Yeah. Yeah. Which really leans into the problem of it's just unblockable and you would never want to block with these things anyway. So. The, sh the feeling of shadow being a sub sub game never manifests. It's just unblockable. Can't block. Uh, well, good news. They, uh, they printed some answers for shadow stuff. Uh, red and green have multiple ways of blocking creatures with shadow. Uh, as example, red has two ways, shadow storm and wall of diffusion. Green has two ways and heartwood dryad and reality anchor. White has a uh, circle protection shadow because these, these people just can't help themselves. I actually don't mind circle shadow if you're going to go down the circle road. Okay. Because the core experience of shadow is so not interactive that giving someone just a random lights out card against them, I think is better than most of the circles they've made. I'll say that. Okay. And uh, then the last card is a land. It is maze of shadows, uh, which again, you probably have seen all these cards on the screen by now. So uh, they did kind of try to have like a safety net against shadow ish yeah you know so uh so those are the, those are the mechanics but we have more in this section because tempest also introduced unique creatures with unique abilities so let's start with something we mentioned earlier in today's episode slivers uh cards with the creature type sliver have an ability or characteristic that they share with other slivers Early slivers share with all slivers in play. Those are slivers from Tempest, Stronghold, Legions, Scourge, Time Spiral, Planner, Chaos, and Future Sight, while later slivers only affect the player side of the board. Magic 2014, Magic 2015, Modern Horizons, Commander Masters have slivers that only impact you and your slivers, which I think is kind of lame. I don't really like that they made that change, but they did, so here we are. Uh, we got two, four, six, eight, ten. We have eleven slivers in Tempest Block. We've got uh two white ones, armor sliver and talon sliver, two blue ones in mnemonic sliver and winged sliver, 
We've got two black ones in clot sliver and mind whip sliver, two red ones in barb sliver and heart sliver, two green ones in horn sliver and muscle sliver, an artifact in metallic sliver. If you remove mechanics from the conversation and just sort of talk about stuff magic has come up with, yeah, this is in the running for number one. Okay. Of, of just the best or the biggest step forward or whatever you want to call it. People really like to grab onto something to build a deck around. It's so hard initially to find something. And slivers are the most obvious. Just find them all and put them in a deck and it does stuff. But they are spread across the five colors. So it's not trivial to just put all of them into a deck. What this means is even if you and I both play slivers at the local shop, there's a very good chance our slivers deck looks very different. True. Um, whether or not you want to preserve the symmetrical thing or not, I think it's good to get rid of it for a couple of reasons. One is like just the my cards hurting me experience does not feel great. Uh, and but probably more importantly, <laughs> it's what happens a lot if symmet- slivers are symmetrical is the game does not end. Yeah, that's, there's potential because we're just uh, all everything has the same stats and evasive keywords. And no one can attack. I saw once, this was way back in the day, you know, it was when there was a, an extended deck uh, slivers. I don't know if you were really around for that. You could kind of call it like a merfolk deck, except it had played dual lands and had a, you know, three or four color mana base. Okay. And the sideboard for the mirror match was Volrath Stronghold. Do you know why? No. Because if you had it and they did not, they would get decked. The game could not move, and you could just, all right, we trade in combat, Volrath, Stronghold back, whatever, go. Okay. You can make no progress in the game, okay. and if you don't have your own, you just get decked eventually. There's no way to proceed. Okay, sure. That's pretty sure. bad. That's not great. That that's is not great, not great and that's, I, I think that's a pretty powerful uh, real-life example of let's just my stuff is my stuff and your stuff is your stuff. What's also nice about that experience too, is if we happen to play a sliver match, your slivers and my slivers are doing different stuff. Like we just play a different game and my blue, white versus your red, green, black, just you have different stuff going on than me. That's a lot more fun than just all of our cards become the same card, which is how symmetrical world works. It just feels like a flavor fail to me. Like with what they're trying to do with slivers being like this alien you know, like group of creatures and they have a queen and they just got all, they all get all the same abilities, right? Because they all, because they all just help each other, right? Like, I think that's a really good story, Mm -hmm. you know, this alien race and you can't really tell the difference between the two. So like realistically, uh, like if you're like some human trying to fight these slivers, it's like one of them is gr- one of you little guys is granting everybody else for a strike, but I don't know which one it is. And so I'm, I'm trying to kill them all. I got it's kind of cool. It is definitely a cool story and it is a, a loss to flavor to go to the other direction. Yeah. That's all. I don't know if you have played sliver mirrors under the old rules. No, it's no. really bad. I, I believe it, you. I believe you. <laughs> it is quite possibly the worst mirror in the history of magic. Those are strong words. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have more creature types to go over that were introduced here. Uh, we've got lissids. <laughs> Come on, man. Let me, let me, let me. Oh, get yeah. Sorry. sorry, sorry. Car- <laughs> I know they're not good. Cards that have the ability to become aura enchantments targeting other creatures representing melding with the host. Uh, there's one in each color. White head, quickening lissid. Blue head, stinging lissid. Black head, leeching lissid. Red had enraging listed and green had nurturing listed. So what I'm going to do is I am going to go to the Tempest Scryfall page and I'm going to read a listed word for word. And the white one again was quickening listed. So here we go. Where are you, old boy? All right. So for one and a white, I get myself one one. I can pay one and a white and tap this quickening listed loses that ability. Excuse me, loses this ability. And becomes a creature enchantment that reads enchanted creature gains first strike instead of a creature. Oh, okay. That reads weird. Move quickening listed onto target creature. You may pay white to end this effect. Very cool concept. Story's awesome. Yeah. Not worth the rules baggage to do five of these. There was a joke back in the day. 
uh, that the level five rules test was just questions about opalescence, humility, and listens. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Love the story here. And this is to some extent a precursor to, um, I would argue, equipment and a variety of equipment adjacent things they've done over the years. Stuff like kind of like bestow. Yeah. As well. the equipment that comes with tokens attached. Yeah. You know, a, a living weapon. Yeah. There's, a, there's analogs all over. So that part of it is cool. This particular implementation is just... Uh, too rulesy and long relative to how good the design space is. Uh, let's transition into the spikes. Or should I say spike? Because there's only one in this set, but there are more coming down the road. I promise you. Uh, spikes are cards that are green at zero, zero creatures with a quote. This enters the battlefield with a number of plus one, plus one counters on it. End quote. And quote. You can pay two colorless and remove a plus one plus one counter from this being the spike to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature, which doesn't have to be a spike. and can be any creature. End quote. Uh, the only one in this set is spike drone. But in the future, of course, there's spike weaver, spike feeder and other spikes. Uh, your thoughts on the spikes? The nuts. So good. I think and it's an fun. interesting contrast with the slivers, too, because the slivers are basically Everything becomes the same thing. Yeah. And these are, well, they all work together, but they sort of uh, channel into different things and different outputs. So you don't get everything at the same time. Mm -hmm. You're sort of picking and mixing and matching. Messing around with counters is really fun. The fact that these interact with other things that generate plus one, plus one counters is fun. So even though the spikes are kind of, it is a little build around me. It isn't just put a bunch of spikes in your deck. You can find other stuff that interacts with them. Yeah. This is awesome. These are cool. Really These cool. Are super cool. Uh, let's see. I think I've got one more. I do. It's the flow stones. Uh, these are cards that grant plus one, minus one, or a multiple thereof. So red has two of them in this set. Flowstone giant and flowstone uh, wyvern. And I mean, pretty simple. It's like, uh, it's not exactly fire breathing. I don't really know what you would call it. But Immolating. Okay. Sure. Yeah. 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 Good call. Yeah. Good call from like immolating soul eater and stuff. Okay. Or no. Uh, the card Immolate. Plus two minus two for a red and Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. I think these are like totally fine. Yeah, I think this design space is probably a little bit more black than red, ultimately. Okay. But at the time, black still got all the frozen shade stuff, and it's kind of weird to do both at the same time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I mean it's a little it's a little weird, but I don't think it plays badly. Yeah, I don't think like, it, I don't think it plays bad. Yeah, and it, you know, the car it's the well, you, you can get fireballed by this thing, but also engaging with it in combat can be a little tricky because the base stats are maybe back heavy a little bit. Whatever. This is good gameplay here. I don't mind it. And now the final part of our mechanics. It's time for the game. And I think this might be a game. Mm. No, you're going to do fine. Okay. You're going to do fine. So creature types introduced in Tempest because some of them have multiple answers that you are not going to answer in full because that would be a ridiculous ask. So uh, we'll get out our uh, we'll get our little scoreboard and our sounds here. Here we go. Talk to me. Crab. Um, King crab. Close. Queen crab. Giant crab. Giant crab. OK. Oh, for one. Lissid. The, li the Lissids. Raging li that yeah. is correct. Shapeshifter. Hint, there are two. Uh, Volrath Shapeshifter? Incorrect. Knew you were going to say that. I could have sworn I looked at something with a V today. V mm -hmm. Shapeshifter in blue. I don't know. Unstable Shapeshifter and Escaped Shapeshifter. Okay. Volrath Shapeshifter comes later. Right. Uh, slivers. Muscle Sliver. Great. And then Spike. The The Spike. <laughs> the one mana one one come on just let it go spike drone spike drone so you got three of five i <laughs> whatever i call it zero out of five all right fair enough yeah uh <laughs> those are the mechanics of tempest so now we're about halfway through the show and we get to go to my favorite part of the show next which is the cycles of tempest coming up next All right, everybody, it is now time for the Cycles of Tempest, and we're going to introduce our newest sponsor of the show, 
Bosch Enrolls YouTube channel. Head over to youtube.com slash Bosch Enroll to watch Eternal Constructed Specialist Brian Koval play a new Eternal deck every single weekday. With over 1,000 videos in his YouTube archive, if there's a certain Eternal card or deck that you want to see in action, Brian has almost certainly played with it, and there will be video for you to watch of it. Best of all, Brian is outrageously good at magic, as he's a SCG Tour Invitational Champion, a Grand Prix Champion, and an Eternal Weekend Vintage Champion. YouTube.com slash Bosch and Roll, where magic history is played every day. Alrighty, let's talk about the nine cycles that Tempest has to offer. And let's start how we should start. The Circles of Protection. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. Awesome. Just another run of these. Now, if you've been watching the show in a little bit, you already know what they are. Uh, each of these common white enchantments has a mana cost of one and a white, and the ability to prevent all the damage from a source of a given color for one. This cycle was reprinted from the core set. All circles had similar art by Harold McNeil. We got cop white, cop blue, cop black, cop red, cop green, and a little extra on top, circle protection, shadow. Okay, so we're doing this again. We're never not doing this, apparently. What makes it so rough in this set, I think this is the worst reprint of them of all time. Okay. Because the color hosers are so egregious. Mm -hmm. It's like if you have light of day in the set, do you need cop black? Yeah, it doesn't. I feel like you were kind of covered <laughs> when they can't attack for the rest of the game. Uh. Do you really? Uh, maybe they have a drain life. I need to have that covered too. Maybe just in case. Yeah. So, I, again, I you know. We just can't stop doing this. I'm not really sure why. We're we're just starting to wind down. Urza Saga still got a, some of that going on, too. Mm -hmm. But we're getting close. See, here's the thing. For those of you who might be new to Magic, playing with these new sets that are coming out that are pretty cool and pretty flavorful and lose to, you know, like some card that's frustrating. Like, I don't know, Rafine, right? You're like, I hate losing. They're like, Shieldred, you know? Like, the thing is, is like, you got to play. <laughs> right like i don't think you understand back in circle protection days so, <laughs> they just cast it and it's like cool you can draw every card in your deck i don't care look if if, she'll, if you gotta be by children i guarantee you at least some stuff happened yeah you drew some <laughs> cards they weren't the right ones because right. you didn't draw like your go for the throat or your oblivion ring or whatever. You double block. They had a removal spell. Yeah, that sucks. Right. Yeah, yeah, that sucks. Something yeah. happened. But you got to like make a decision and have yeah. maybe a little yeah. bit of agency. This, they just they, they just play it and it's over. And that's a great transition to the next cycle. The hoser double cycle. Let me repeat that. Hoser double cycle. Each color has two uncommon cards that prey on its enemy colors. Okay. White. The aforementioned light of day and warmth. Blue has chill and insight. Black has perish and dread of night. Red has havoc and boil. And green has choke and reap. Why won't they just let people play their fun card game? I really appreciate the fact that the anti-red and anti-black hosers just is a little extra something. There are just enchantments. So can, you cannot get them off the table if you're playing those colors. Sure. Just, yeah. just in case. Yeah, that's just nice. In, these are just so outrageous. I don't even really know where to begin. I like that just they're so it, like light of day. You're done. You're yeah. done. Okay, cool. Chill. You don't even get to do anything. Cool. Uh, perish, all your shit's dead. Or Dread of Night, most of your creatures in white are small and die. Boil, no more. We're done playing. Yeah. Choke, we're effectively done playing. D Dread of Night is so horrible, but it's, <laughs> it's one of the better ones here. Sure. Because it's like, sometimes you need a second one. The sure. first one is sure. not necessarily game over by itself. The rest of these are just, yeah, choke. So for me, <laughs> whenever these show up, I always think about if I was uh, like part of the team of designing, and developing the cards, like what did the original versions look like and what were the changes? Was Boyle like two in a red destroy all islands? And they were like, eh. It's well, see, there's a four. fun little sub game that's going on with a lot of these hosers too. Because 
if you chill your red opponent, they probably can't boil you. But if you boil your chill opponent, they mm-hmm. can't chill you after it. It's true. Yeah, that's, that's fun. True. That's I, like a little cat and mouse game. Yeah, it's something. That's so that's nice. A little, that's a little something. <laughs> these uh, are these are so bad. Uh, we're moving on to uh, a set, a, a cycle that we've already gone over in the uh, in the in the <laughs> mechanics portion. It's the listeds again. Uh, very quickly, uh, each of these common one one listed creatures has a mana cost of one in a color and the ability to turn itself into an aura enchantment, attaching itself to a creature or back to its normal state. Again, white is quickening listed, blue is stinging listed, uh, black is leeching listed, red is enraging listed, and green is nurturing listed. Okay, great. We did that in the previous portion. If you want to know our thoughts about listeds. Go back to the mechanics. It's easy on YouTube. Medallions we have not gone over yet. Each of these rare artifacts has a mana cost of two and reduces the cost of spells of a given color by one. Some of them have residual images from a dirty press. Okay, maybe that's worth more than others. Uh, Pearl medallion, sapphire medallion, jet medallion, ruby medallion, and emerald medallion. These these medallions are naturally named after um, the Moxon, which is kind of cool. These rule. These are love really these. These are really good. So we know the moxes are no good, right? This is just too powerful. Yeah. So go to barrage, you do the diamonds. Nothing wrong with that. They're still quite good, but they're clearly much worse than moxes. Yes. And in weather way, you have mind stone. It's different. At least it has its own different dimension going on, but we're clearly not doing the moxes anymore. Yeah. What is nice about these, they're not strictly weaker than Moxes. There's a ton of time where this ends up producing way more than one mana in one turn. What happens to be pretty good at a baseline, because when you see the medallions, you're like, oh, well, if I really want to do the thing, I need to be playing two cards in one turn. That's how I start getting paid off. Okay. What's a way to play two cards in one turn? Buyback. Yeah. Okay. So it's just, it fits in snug as a bug in a rug okay, in terms yeah. of, of what's going on. It stands on its own two feet. They're just cool cards. But the fact that a level one thing you can do to get the two cards in one turn experience is one of the keywords of the set. Awesome. These are probably still one. My issues with the medallions are one, too strong and two, too loudly about monocolor decks. Yeah. You can play a fire true. diamond in your two color deck and to cast whatever. These only work with the color in question. So they are a little bit too linear, in my opinion, for how powerful they are or can be in some spots. But there's some really cool, subtle stuff going on here. Uh, our next cycle are the common slivers. Uh, of course, we did go over the slivers in the mechanics portion. So if you'd like to learn more of our thoughts on these, uh, you can, of course, head over there. But uh, for the common slivers, each of these common 1-1 one, one sliver creatures cost one in a color and has an ability that it grants to all slivers, including itself. Uh, there's talent sliver, winged sliver, clot sliver, heart sliver, and muscle sliver. And then we have our uncommon slivers. Each of these uncommon two two sliver creatures costs two and an M, so two in a color, and grants an ability which activates for two to all slivers, including itself. There's armor sliver, mnemonic sliver, mind whip sliver, barb sliver, and horned sliver. So those are the slivers. Now we're going to move on to the uh, gold allied colored spells. Little quick note on the slivers there. Oh, I think ahead. it is a little weird that. They are just, oh, the second copy doesn't do anything Mm -hmm. in most cases, except for Muscle Sliver, where the second and additional copies are busted. Are very good. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually a really good point. Yeah. That's actually a really good point. Uh, Gold allied colored spells. Each of these uncommon spells, one for each allied two color combination, has a mana cost that includes both of its colors. So let's take a little look, Skipoo, here. Actually, you know what? Impromptu game. Sky Spirit. To white and blue. Do you know what that card does? Uh, I think it's two two flying first strike for blue white one. Let's let's uh, let's see here. Let's see if I can get to my gold cards. He is. What did you say it was? I think it's white blue one two two flying first strike. That is correct. Yeah, they were trying to get Thunder Spirit through the back door because uh, they put it on the reserve list. Uh, so this is like their way of doing it without doing it. Okay. Uh, Crafty. Lobotomy. Blue, black, two, sorcery. Name a non-land card. 
search your opponent's hand, graveyard, and library for all copies of those cards and remove them from the game. Um, you are sort of incorrect. Lobotomy is look at target player's hand. Oh, I did. I thought oh, I'm thinking of a cranial thinking of extraction. extraction. Yeah. Look yeah. at target player's hand and choose wow. any of those cards other than a basic. Washed. And then you take that and all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Which makes sense for a lobotomy. Uh, spontaneous combustion. It's a black red card. Do you remember this one? No. All right. This one's one, a black and a red. It's an instant. Sacrifice a creature. Spontaneous combustion deals three damage to each creature. Okay. Okay. Uh, next up, we have a segmented worm. It's a red green creature. <laughs> Is this like a... Uh, like a six mana f- five five and it like puts minus one minus one counters on something. You are in the you're in the ballpark. Okay, uh, so five mana five five three three RG. Uh, so whatever segmented worm is the target of a spell or ability, put a minus one minus one counter on. Okay, so you're in the ballpark. And then last but not least, there's Ranger on Vec. It's a green and a white, green and white card. So like a two two forest walker for four. Uh, it is a one, a white, and a green. So it's a three mana, two, two, first strike. You can pay a green to regenerate it. Okay. Not particularly in the ballpark that time. Uh, those are the gold allied colored spells. They're whatever. Right. Right. They exist. Uh, let's go to nap lands. You might have some experience with these. Each of these uncommon dual lands can be tapped for a colorless or one mana of two allied colors. If tapped for the latter, it doesn't untap during your next untap step. Uh, the five cards are Thalicos Lowlands. Root Water Depths, Cinder Marsh, Mog Hollows, and Vec Townships. These are uh, kind of stinky dual lands. Yeah, I mean, lower rarity, and you can tap them for Collis. This is still probably just way weaker than you're supposed to do. Yeah. You know, give people some mana fixing that's not horrendous when they start playing Magic and they just have a couple of packs. But I for the standards of the time, this is pretty reasonable. I would agree with that. Yeah, I would agree with that. And then we have the enemy colored enters the battlefield tapped pain lands. Each of these rare lands comes into play tapped and can be tapped for colorless or one mana of two enemy colors. If tapped for the latter, it deals one damage to you. Uh, Salt Flats is your white black land. Caldera Lake is your blue red land. Pine Barrens is your black green land. Scab Land is your red white land. Sky Shroud Forest is your green blue land. So if you want to play enemy colors, uh, you have to work for it even harder because these lands are worse than the ones we just mentioned. Well, they're not strictly worse, right? Oh, I guess the, the drawback's different. Oh, yeah, the drawback. I thought that if you tapped them for the mana, they stayed tapped. No, so they just ETB tapped, and then right. and then they're um, they're effectively pain lands. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's not that bad. Uh, well, I I don't think you're supposed to do these at rare. Okay, sure. It's just like t- just too disappointing to open this sort of thing. Sure. Okay. Um, I don't mind the whole, well, the enemy colors, they are supposed to be worse at fixing their mana and being a deck that you can play than the allied ones, at least at the time. That's something that Magic's kind of gotten away with. Sometimes they do allied cycles of dual lands, but often they're just kind of doing all 10. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, it communicates something, I guess. These are just really, really weak, especially in relation to ha- just how powerful the mono color incentives are in this set. Sure. Um, there's a, a ton of awesome cards for one mana. Uh, there are the medallions. There's Wasteland. Um, so I don't think that these cards are the biggest sin, but this set could use way better than this, given where a lot of where the power lies. Tempest also has two matched pairs that we're going to go over very quickly here to round out this portion of the show. Uh, Warmth versus Havoc. Each of these uncommon enchantments cost one in a color and rewards you or punishes an opponent, respectively, when another player casts a spell of the other's color. So Warmth, you gain life if they cast a red spell, and Havoc, you deal them two if they cast a blue spell. I think that's what it is. thought Havoc was anti... Oh, you... Sorry. What color is Havoc? I'm going to assume it's red. Oh, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah, I think you got it. I want to confirm here really quick. Because it's an enemy colored thing. Yeah. So whenever target opponent successfully cast a white spell, excuse me, he yeah. or she loses two life, not a blue spell. And then warmth is whenever they cast a red, you gain two. You gain two. Yeah. You ever play with that one? I've played against it. Okay. 
Oh, yeah, I mean, really, not, not play with, excuse me, played against. I mean, yeah. it's really good against the right people, but yeah. it's not chill. Well, a few things are. And, and I also don't even mind. It's so much stronger against warmth to be playing creatures than spells. And the creatures are naturally more interactive. Sure. So if you're going to go after the, uh, you know, two ma- one mana, two, one in burn spell experience. I'd way rather punish the burn spells than the creatures and warmth is that's kind of where it's landing. Uh, and then there's scalding tongs versus thumb screws. Mm-hmm. Each of these rare artifacts costs two and deals damage to an opponent. If you have a low or high number of cards in hand, respectively. So scalding tongs, we will read here, uh, at the beginning of your upkeep, if you have three or fewer cards in hand, Scalding Kongs deals one damage to target opponent or or Planeswalker. Oh, brutal. Errata. Brutal. I don't like that errata. Uh, and then Thumb Screws. This is the opposite here. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you have five or more cards in hand, Thumb Screws deals one damage to target opponent or Planeswalker. So I'm trying to think because we've, we've talked about it on the show. The Black Vice, the Rack, if you're too big, if you're too small. Mm-hmm. So the thumb screws presumably would be more effective against someone who's larger because it would take less time for the screws to get down. Okay. And the tongs, I can't suss it out. I feels think they, like, might be getting, they might be getting away from the big, small analogy. It feels like the saw. tongs are just going to hurt anyone. Right. Because they're yeah. hot. Yeah. It doesn't, they've gotten away. It's more of an abstraction now, which I think is for the best. Uh, everybody, that and those are the cycles of Tempest. Now we are going to go on to a very thick and juicy trivia portion of our show right after this. Alrighty, everybody. I promised you a juicy and thick trivia section, and that's exactly what you're going to get because, yes, I do see your YouTube comments. Yes, for our loyal Jacko Pups, I do see your DMs in our Patreon. And I understand that you'd like a little more of the trivia section. So here it comes. We're going to start things off with the fact that Tempest has five functional reprints. Clergy in Anvec is a functional reprint of Samite Healer from 5th edition. Pit Imp is a functional reprint of Vampire Bats in 5th edition. Rootwater Hunter is a functional reprint of Prodigal Sorcerer in 5th edition and Zoron Spellcaster from Ice Age. A Sky Shroud, Sky Shroud Troll, excuse me, is a functional reprint of Gorilla Chieftain from Alliances. And Staunch Defenders is a functional reprint of Spiritual Guardian from Portal. So for those of you who like functional reprints, there you go. You're covered. Next, Banned and Restricted Cards. Cool. Now, you can speak towards this a little bit better than I can because you were around for this. Let's start with Earthcraft. Mm-hmm. Banned in Standard in 1999 and Legacy in 2003. Yeah, it's pretty easy to go infinite with this one. So, Earthcraft is, was this one in a green? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an enchantment. I think it's, was it tap a creature, untap a land? Is that what that is? Tap an untapped creature you control, untap target basic land. Mm-hmm. Now, I know the... It was a squirrel nest earth craft combo. Right. I know that one. I'm sure there are plenty now. It's like Query and Ranger, just like Wirewood Symbiote stuff. There's just, it's just not that hard to just be on infinite. It's got to be super easy now yeah. with how many cards have been made. Okay. So uh, I know a lot of people, Wind Splitters, when coming back, well, Earthcraft's never coming back. Maybe one day they'll do it in Legacy if they just don't care very much anymore. I'd be surprised. But it's just, you know. It's not really that interesting. Uh, I'm going to save this next one for the last one. Uh, Lotus Petal, Restricted and Vintage. Mm -hmm. Probably for the best. Yeah. Uh, You can play four of them in Legacy. That's correct. Which is kind of nice. And I don't know how good it was in Standard. Um, I mean, there were some... Well, once you get to Urza Saga. Yeah. Now we're talking about something else. Okay. It's like Polarian Academy. It's pretty good with that. Why? Well, (laughs) you're sort of getting... Uh, I mean, it it, it it started getting, uh, it started picking up a little bit more as you get to the end of the block because, uh, very good with Oath of Druids as like a turn one play. Okay. Um, it was quiet for a little while, but once you get to Saga, it's like, forget about it. Okay. Uh, Grindstone. 
was banned in Commander in 2008 due to the combo alongside Painter Servant. It was unbanned, and Painter Servant was banned in Commander in 2009. And believe it or not, both are legal in Commander today. Okay. If you play Grindstone and Painter Servant in your Commander deck, you're you're a loser. Yeah. Your friends, you don't have yeah, any. Yeah. When you leave the room, they're just talking like, "Where can you can that can they go get a new deck?" Don't invite them back. Oh wow. You turn my whole deck blue and then mill me. What an interesting combo. It's really fun. You're so smart. <laughs> it's really fun. Uh, and then the one I saved for last is Curse Scroll was banned in Tempest Block Constructed. Yeah, this card is so sick. Yeah. <laughs> this card is so sick. Uh, it's going to win an award later on in the show. I don't know what Tempest Block Constructed looked like, but clearly they needed to well, get Well, the, the Pro this Tour thing. was Tempest only. Oh. That card was a pro, uh, uh, was strong. No, yeah, stronghold. I think maybe was involved because I think Mog Flunkies was maybe illegal. Okay, I don't remember. But the one that Dave Price won. Okay, the card was a problem. It's a good card. Yeah, it's a good card. We're gonna talk about it a little bit more mm-hmm. in the show. Uh, here comes some random trivia. Just some things, some odds and ends that I found. Alluren is an old English word that means paradise. Cool. Looks like it on the card. Apes of Wrath is a pun on the grapes of wrath. Nerds. Awful. Also, did, what did, can you bring up the flavor text? Of Apes of Wrath? Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a red card. Uh, A green, probably. I'm not sure. Mm, no, you're, you're like, right. Is there a Steinbeck quote on this, or is it just... <sighs> monkeys three, monkeys through. That's not a pun. It has nothing to do with the book, Grapes of Wrath. To tell you what I found. It's not a that's not a pun. Okay. Well, you can review the notes next time. Yeah. I'll take it out next time. Is rat would wrath of God be a pun if it was R A T H? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Uh Bayou Dragonfly was inspired by a video game that was to be released in conjunction with magic, but was never published. Uh I actually looked this up. Mark Rosewater detailed in an article that the card makes no sense in the context of wrath. And that they, quote, took the square peg and jammed it into the round hole because we wanted to be cooperative. If you're wondering what Bayou Dragonfly does, I'm sure it's on the screen, of course. But uh, it is one in a green. It's a 1-1 one, one flying swamp walk. Good luck blogging that. Yeah. Uh, so flying in green, not really a thing. Swamp walk, no. Uh, flying s- land walk, kind of a <laughs> weird thing to put together. <laughs> Look at me flying on this swamp. Yeah. Just killing it Good out here. Good luck <laughs> blocking this thing. Yeah. So I believe him when he says it was made for a game. Uh, Aladomri, Lord of Leaves, was named as a tribute to Michael G. Ryan's mother, Irma, and his stepfather, Dale. That's a thing you can do when you design cards is you can do some tributes. Yep. M- uh, MSC Tome, again, I think I'm saying this right, follows the R&D tradition of naming tomes using one of the R&D members' initials. In this case, Michael Scott Elliott, MSE. That's definitely MSE Tome then. Got it. Nerds. Intuition was originally intended to fetch three cards with different names, but the playtest card was written as just three cards and R&D enjoyed the way it played. Mark Rosewater later designed Gifts Ungiven to fetch cards with different names to have a card that functioned the way intuition, intuition excuse me, was originally supposed to. I don't really like either of those cards, so whatever. Okay, well, that settles that. <laughs> One is just a uh, just demonic tutor, basically, as long as you're playing three copies of the card, mm-hmm. and the other one is so much about either setting up a loop where it doesn't matter what you give your opponent, or only finding two cards and putting them both in your graveyard and then doing something on your graveyard. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, honest gifts on given is pretty fun when someone just gets like, here's some stuff I like. Yeah. Give me the ones you don't care about the most. Yeah, I kind of like that. That's just not how it goes. No, never. no one does that. Yeah. Uh, Lina, again, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. The Saltari Emissary was named after Mark Rosewater's mother, Lynn. Mog Squad is a play on the Mob Squad. The 60s show about three undercover cops posing as hippies. The flavor text reflects this spoof. Let's confirm. Since I know you're a bit of a stickler. Uh, okay, here we go. 
As they crept into the weatherlight's hold, the squad leader held up his hand and whispered, Stop, goblins. What's that sound? I check out for you? No? Okay, I'm going to move on to the next thing. The sigh has said all it needs to say. Nerds. The flavor text of Time Warp is a reference to a song from the Rocky Horror Picture Show called Time Warp. I seriously, I was about to say, is there a reference to the musical Oklahoma in the set? <laughs> sure. I don't and think then so. that, that you, then that I did. I did look deeper into this and this is confirmed. Uh, and then I've got a uh, Vahadi Ildal's name is derived from Bogavadi, which is the code name of the set. Okay. Okay. Believe that. And then Tempest was originally intended to have a major poison theme, but in the end, all poison cards were pulled from the set. Okay. Another fun fact that I did do some deeper diving into and confirmed. So there you go. I know on the uh, on the popular podcast, the uh, the rewatchables, they call it half-assed internet research. You could say some of this is half-assed, but I looked hard. Now, let us dive into the section that everyone always asks us for and now i have worked into the show notable cards that we haven't talked about yet are you ready ready i have them listed of every color we're gonna try to do this somewhat quickly i'm gonna start with humility any notes shouldn't do this (laughs) does not does 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 not (laughs) does not play well I think it's generally fun when creatures have <laughs> abilities. And then also there's some terrible rules baggage with it. Okay. Uh, I don't really have much of a humility. The only humility story that I have, I'll tell this one really quickly. I was playing in an SCG Open in Seattle uh, way back when. I played against Joe Lissette in the last round of the Swiss. Mm-hmm. This is when Joe was playing Miracles. And he would oftentimes have a Haymaker enchantment in his board. It was either Moat or Humility. Mm-hmm. And I was playing Goblins. And he cast humility, which obviously makes all my cards suck, but like his draw wasn't very good. I could keep attacking and I stopped attacking because I thought he played moat because <laughs> I was so used to it being. Oh. moat. So I just stopped attacking and he was looking at me funny. And then like in turns, I was like, holy shit, that's humility. And he's like, yeah, it's really weird. You weren't attacking. And then we drew and he made the top eight and I got ninth on breakers. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, there you go. That's my humility story. Uh, blue capsize. No additional story necessary, I hope. Really fun stuff. Dismiss? Uh, I mean, it's kind of whatever. Mm-hmm. I think this is better than what you're supposed to do, but a lot of this is just compounding sins upon sins. It's not like this is the worst thing, but when you're doing Whispers of the Muse and Forbid and... Just another, here's a two for one. Here, I'm just accruing material. I don't even care about it because I'm just converting it into other materials somewhere down the line. Um, if you want to do this thing, you can do something a little bit more dynamic. Sure. And, um, you know, this was a net negative, I think, for standard at the time. Uh, intuition. I have no dismissed story, by the way. Intuition. Sure. I mean, fine. Really appealing. Um, and not especially powerful at doing the tutoring thing as far as it goes, because you need to be playing at least three copies and it's three mana. And if you care, if you're just kind of tutoring for value, then you don't have the other ones in your deck anymore. Um, You know, fine, whatever. Uh, I have an intuition story. A person whose name will not be revealed here, but this did happen. Uh, Wrote an article about intuitioning for creeping chills. And how they would take six and you'd have a creeping chill in your hand. And then me having to explain to them very gently that that's not how any of this works. Mm-hmm. It's not how any of it works. But imagine if you could. That's what I'll say to that. Legacy is a lure. Probably one of the most criminally underrated constructed cards of all time. Really good card. Really good. Probably really underrated in Commander too, because this is a, a perfect... One card super good over a long timeline when nothing's going on, mm-hmm. and talk about a card that tells your opponent don't attack me. Yeah, can't do a whole lot better than otherwise this. Otherwise, I'm taking your shit. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's this card point. is completely cracked. No one ever played it because it was the seventh best control magic. <laughs> sure, sure. It was legal at the time. Sure. It was just that was the time that we were in. There you go. Uh, I have no legacy as a lure story. Mana severance. Cool card. Yeah. Yeah. Really fun thing to think about. And it's nice because there is just the, for as fancy as the card is and as extreme as it is, there is kind of a baseline case of, yeah, I don't want to draw any more lands. I've thin all my lands on my deck. Yeah. But you can go quite a bit deeper than that, of course. Yeah. I know there were some decks in Saga, like the Belcher, the Belcher Mana Severance deck. Sure. I don't know if that was in Saga Block or Extended or something, but like it did well in a Pro Tour. It had to be extended because Severance and Char Belcher never were. Oh, yeah. You definitely extended that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Meditate. I don't really have a story about Meditate. I would just say that I think this is a really cool card. Yeah. That's fu- all. Fun, fun card. A little. I think a little too similar to intuition to do in the same set, but definitely a cool thing to think about. Propaganda. Really rough. Uh, not a blue effect. And just not that much fun and making your opponent pay man to attack you happens to be really good with cap size. True. There you go. Okay. What's one more? <laughs> Trade Wind Rider. Pretty fun. I mean, this is, again, pretty weird to do in a set with cap size. This is the second just permanent boomerang. Yeah, bong. But this is actually like asking you to build a deck, not just make your land drops. That's true. Um, yeah, I, I, I have some fondness for this design. Uh, I, I just, so on a baseline, I don't think permanent boomerang plays that well. Okay. Not a thing you're supposed to be doing. But Trade Wind Rider is a league's better design than cap size. That's, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, okay, we move on to where'd my script go? Darn it! There it is. We're moving on to black now. Bet you didn't know this was in the set. Dark ritual. We haven't mentioned it yet. Great. What the hell is this doing here? Yeah, set is really short on insane one mana cards <laughs> that just blow your opponent out of the water before the game even begins. Yeah, it's scratching an itch that nothing else does. <laughs> so what's this, what the heck is it doing here? I don't know. Uh, Diabolic edict. Uh, this is new. I believe this is the first edict. Okay, I think you're right. And yeah. it's a fun, you know, I, I remember seeing this card. It's so simple. And it's like, why would I want this instead of terror? And then you can start thinking about the pros and cons, and it's kind of cool to think about. Yeah, okay. Uh, Living Death. Pretty cool design. Yeah. A little, little ex- intense slash extreme, but a lot of fun stuff to do with it. Ended up being a pretty good card. Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's fun. What's fun about this is, if you're just doing the Wrath of God thing, this is bad because yeah. uh, the second copy definitely doesn't work and the first copy might not work either. Yeah. So you do have to be playing into the I'm doing some stuff. When you get to Saga Block, it's really good with creatures with Echo because they naturally die. So a really fun card to to build around and think about. Reanimate. So this is a lot for one mana. Pretty powerful card. Because the other ones are, this is like Animate Dead, which you can blow up and it's two mana. And then you have Dance of the Dead, which doesn't even really work. Yep. This is a, a pretty intense version of that experience. Yeah, this is, this. I mean, this is pushed to the max and they would never make this card again. Not even close to making this card. And it's just a nice little bonus that it gets your opponent's graveyard too. Yeah, why does it do that? That's weird. Uh, comes up way more than you think. Sarcomancy. Uh, Something sweet here. I mean, I the two power one drop with a drawback thing. Uh, there's definitely an audience for it. Agreed. I don't think they're supposed to be the best cards in standard, which is unfortunately a lot of what's going on here. Uh, but this is at least a there's at least a story here, which is something. Moving on to red next. Fire Slinger. Um. Yeah, just another negative costing thing that's kind of about. Locking your opponent out as soon as possible and stacks with the other pinger effects. Showed up a bunch in type two good block. Card. I know it was a good card. It might not hold up today just because creature removal is a lot more ubiquitous, but if the game's just balanced all around one mana creatures with one toughness, this has a home. Uh, Goblin Bombardment. Shout out Sam Black. Cool. Um, yep. Yeah, fun card. And it's a little rough because the fact that it's unbounded, there's no mana, whatever means that the going infinite is a big part of it. But the card shows up a lot in decks that are just kind of going finite with grave crawlers and such. Yeah. So cool. 
Um, fun story, fun name. This was popular. Uh, Jackal Pup. That's all of you out there. First of all, shout out. Uh, second of all, one man at two one. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you've given quite a few beatdowns with this. Yeah, I've I've laid some very serious lumber. Uh, Kindle, which I think is just kind of a cool card as far as like counting and you you're incentivized to play four. So much, so much fun. It's actually fun. Yeah, right? yeah. Inspiration for a lot of design space. Yeah. yeah. A uh, Mog Fanatic, back when damage used to go on the stack, uh, busted. Mm-hmm. Now, not so much. Yeah, I mean it's it's been outbonded pretty safely at this point, but yeah. uh, a card with a long and storied history. And the last red card, a card I actually think of you quite a bit when I see it, Wrathy Dragon. <laughs> uh, people thought this was going to be good. No. Uh, and it actually did have a little bit of a home because it was good in red mirrors. It was good in the sideboard of red deck wins. Yeah. I remember that. This is another card that was unfortunately not very good against cap size. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of limited it as a main deck player. That's true. But it, it did show up in sideboards, including the absolutely horrendous deck that I grinded into PTLA with when it was reprinted in standard. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. It is my side, deck. What? Yeah, my yeah. sideboard had a bunch of Wrathy Dragons and a bunch of mountains to support it. Oh, that's just good deck building. Yeah, I know. Uh, green cards. Aluren, I have a story. There's a Grand Prix in Columbus. Come on, man. Why are you laughing at me already? There's a Grand Prix in Columbus in 2010, if memory serves, uh, in which leading into the Grand Prix, back on Magic Online, there was something called daily events. And like uh, there were DEs and PEs. I think PE stood for premier event. It was like on the weekend. Uh, leading into that tournament, all I was doing was playing. Uh, I was living out my finals days in West Lafayette. Uh, I was not in college anymore, but I was living out my lease. And the tournament was in August, and I was going to move all my stuff uh, back to my parents' place. And there was a Grand Prix in Columbus, so it was a great uh, like intermediary spot for my parents to actually drive down from Cleveland, get all my stuff out of Gabe Walls' Escalade, and take it up, and then I'd play in the tournament and someone driving back. So it was actually kind of perfect. But leading up to that tournament, I was playing and learn a lot online, and I won two premier events in a row. And that's kind of the equivalent of doing well in like a magic online like showdown or something or whatever like the good magic online tournament now is of a format you'd go like oh man like this deck one that's a really big deal right i won two of those two weekends in a row with learn and everyone's like learn really good and i'm like yeah i think so and so for that grand prix a lot of people were looking for a learn cards and i kind of set the format because of the two daily event wins did you play in this grand prix i did play in this grand prix okay i played against i played uh burn with Kill and Fiend. Okay. No games played before tournament. This is what you played. Yes. Okay. You said played against. Sorry. So you played. I played Burn. No games played before the event. Okay. Top 32. Nice. Played against Alern at least twice. Yeah. Uh, I know for sure Dave Williams beat me. Okay. I know that Dave Williams played the deck. I know for sure I beat Todd Anderson. Okay. And I think I might have played against Reed Duke also playing Alern. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I went 03 faster than you could possibly imagine. <laughs> I got decimated in that tournament. And most of the people who played Learn did not do very well and were just like, how did you win these tournaments? And, you know, if I'm being honest, I got a little lucky in those tournaments on Magic Online. But I was not smart enough then to recognize that I was getting fortunate because I just had so many tickets. I was so proud of myself. Yeah. So uh, that's my Learn story. Uh, it was... Uh- one of the competitive magic moments that I remember the most starkly happened. I was playing against Dave Williams. Okay. He beat me in the match, but I won the second game. And it's a spot where he's clearly got nothing going on. And I'm just sort of like chaining together spells to kill him. And the last spell I play for lethal, it's a lava spike. And I go, try to lava spike you. And he goes, you're going to try to lava spike me, huh? And then he picked up all of his cards. Yeah. And I was like, I probably should have just said, try to like, like just bite yeah, Try to, yeah. <laughs> Cause he was like very obviously checked out of the game and just <laughs> waiting for me to show lethal. Yeah, sure. Oh, you're going to try to, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Good attempt, but it worked. Uh, Earthcraft, we've talked about not going to be unbanned anytime soon. Aldamri's Vineyard. Any stories there? This thing adds like two green mana. Yeah, it's uh, it, this is one of the this is one of the cards that is 
a very different animal with mana burn. Yes. That was a like a large part of what is going on here. Really popular design. Uh, I think, again, just a little too extreme and intense for its power level and the fact that it's one mana, but another card that had an audience. Aldamri Lord of Leaves is your uh, is your elf lord. All elves gain forest walk and they can't be the target of spells or abilities. Notably, this is not an elf. When it was printed, at least, it was summon legend. Now it is an elf warrior. Oh, my. What do they do? Look how they massacred my boy. His, the original version is probably between us. Okay, cool. So you can see that. Scryfall says, now note, note that this, it, it was a legend. It is now an elf warrior. Other elves creatures have forest walk. Okay. And then other elves have shroud. That is not the heart of the card. Is it still a legend? Yes. Okay. Let's look. It did. You were reading all the time. They just made this thing not a legend. It did retain that. Sure. Do you know how expensive this card is? I'm sure it's a, a, a fair bit of money. Fifty eight dollars. Sick. Who's playing this thing? All right. Anyway, is it on the reserve list. It must be on the reserve list. Yeah, maybe. I don't. Yeah. Know. Overrun. Uh, iconic. Aw- awesome. Yeah. This was a. <laughs> you know, this was an important card in Magic's history because you have this delta. I've talked about it of. The people who played with the cards they found appealing. Mm-hmm. And then the people who knew what was going on. That was just like, it's all about mana acceleration, mana draining you, card advantage, et cetera, et cetera. And this was a card that let the ding dongs actually win sometimes. That's right. It was good enough. It was good enough that if they had a tested deck with a bunch of mana elves and whatever creatures they had in Overrun, they, kill you. they could kill you sometimes. Yep. Great card. Uh, here's one that I haven't thought about in a long time. Scragnoth. Oh, come on. This what? is another, this is another. What? Well, no, the problem is that this is another, like, oh, I'm going to get him this time. <laughs> and it's just not that at all. Oh, it's all scraggy. Yeah. Uh, heart's in the right place. Uh, the problem is this is an, in an in a odd way also does not line up well against cap size because it's so much mana that by the time you're ready to play, they're capsizing your force. Yes. Yeah, so you can't even do it. You can't even do it. <laughs> Do it. Uh, and then lastly in green, we have Verdant Force. Maybe the, this might be wrong, but kind of like the original threat to reanimate. This was another, this was another good one for the ding dongs. <laughs> <This is laughs> like right. actually a creature you could ramp into that was good enough to win the game. Yeah. Jamie Wakefield did a lot of that with natural order and just playing with like elves and wall of roots kind of made a name for himself. Okay. It was one of the first creatures that was, powerful enough to reanimate people built reanimator decks around this card yep because if, if it came out on turn two like yeah, that's you pretty lose good. you lose they do of course they do a lot better than uh burden force these days but this was the first one where uh in terms of the mana acceleration and or reanimate sort of thing this was a payoff that was good enough to build a deck around a couple of artifacts here <laughs> altar of dementia uh more so i think known during the hogak days Real, but it was a beloved card, even, 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 even. Yeah, the there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with it. The fact that it's it's symmetrical too means that I can either be fueling me myself or trying to mill you. Okay, it it feels pretty evil. Like there's a good sinister vibe to it. Yeah. So if you know if you're in that space, it uh it rings a certain positive way. Uh, next up is bottle gnomes. People played this funny beloved design. Was one of the better sideboard cards against the red decks at the time because it was a lot of two ones and one ones. Also, really good when damage stacked. Uh, back yeah. in the day. Yep. 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 Uh, more of a tournament history than you would probably anticipate if you're newer to the game. Uh, grindstone, we already went over. <laughs> Lotus Petal, we've already gone over. Two left. Scroll Rack. A uh, card that you can build combo or control decks around. Mm-hmm. Um, very good if you are shuffling your deck and was kind of in the. Sylvan library space a little bit, but without the okay, with so with Sylvan library, you don't really have to ask any questions because you just draw three the turn after and you're up. Yep. Scroll rack is well, the next turn, I'm just redrawing the same stuff I had before. So to make the thing really hum, you need to be shuffling or doing something else, manipulating the top of your deck. So an interesting little deck building challenge. And there's been decks that played quite a bit of them. They've it's been a 
Enlightened Tutor target and Oath of Druids deck. So, card with a lot of history. And then the last artifact is Static Orb. Uh, so this is the, the attempt to fix Winter Orb. This is arguably worse. Yeah. Because Winter Orb doesn't necessarily lock you out of the game anytime it's played. Yeah. Because sometimes I'm attacking you. Yeah. And you Winter Orb me and it's like, okay, well, I got already got what I what I need. Static Orb doesn't have that problem. No, it just it makes the game horrible. Yeah, that was in uh, Eugene Harvey's Nationals winning deck. His first, I, I was wondering when he was going to come up on this podcast. Mm-hmm. With a uh, squirrel nest in opposition. As so, you know. Yeah. So, what do you do? Well, you untap the squirrel nest. So, now I got you. And then I can tap it to tap the stag orb and see where this is going. Yeah, you don't get to play. This is a pretty rough design. Uh, four lands, and then we move on to the award show. Ancient Tomb, just busted. Cool design. <laughs> cool design. Yeah. Super fun. Yeah. I just worry this set doesn't have enough cards that <laughs> blowing someone out on turn one. Uh, reflecting Pool. Cool. Little rulesy, but yeah, this was be- so beloved relative to power level. Yeah. Cool yeah. card. Like, when, when it was in the Vivid <laughs> decks that Chapin used to make, I thought it was really cool, man. Yeah, that that was probably a little bit too much. It uh, definitely was. There, there's something to the. I think you can end up putting a lot of rate and making some really appealing designs when it's mana fixing when you've already fixed your mana. Yeah, and there's still a purpose to it because, well, maybe I'm trying to play double pip cards or whatever. The vivid land alongside of this is is a little too free, uh, but even if you're straining for it, this card was pretty beloved. Uh, we have stalking stones, um, wind condition. Yeah, just a, a a nice game, a nice way to wrap up the game after you've whispered and capsized a million times. You got to kill him somehow, and this does it. And, and tap for a colorless along the way. That's true. Uh, speaking of tapping for a colorless along the way, Wasteland is our final card. Yeah, we fixed strip mine. No problems. Nothing to see here. There was a brief moment in uh, Type One. I think they fixed this pretty fast, but you could play four strip mines and four wastelands. Oh. But pretty soon thereafter, if my memory serves, they restricted shirt mine, and that's still the state of affairs. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Fair enough. All right, everybody. Trivia. Juicy and thick, just like I said. It's all done. And now we are headed to everybody's favorite part of the show, the award show, right after this. All right, everybody, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our favorite part of the show. It's everybody's favorite part of the show. It's the award show for Tempest. We are going to start, as we always do, with the Oko Thief of Crowns Award for best card in the set. Patrick and I, we have the same answer. It is Wasteland. Usually I try to answer this question through the lens of what would be the most ruinous card to reintroduce to standard? This passes that test and also many others. A lot of competition in this set because there's a lot of really cracked cards, but I believe Wasteland is the top of the list. My answer for a little while was Ancient Tomb, but I decided to go with Wasteland. I think it's pretty close, though. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty close. Yeah, it is close. Uh, The Carnival Souls Award for worst card in the set. I will will let you begin because I don't know the card. All right. I'm going to go with Phyrexian Splicer. What color is this? This is an artifact. Okay. Uh, you can go ahead. I'm going to read it. Yeah, I want you to get. I want you to read this because oh, okay. there's a little uh, bonus. It's, it's a two man artifact. You can pay two and tap it. Choose flying, first strike, trample, or shadow. Target creature with that ability loses it until end of turn. Another target creature gains that ability until end of turn. Okay. So, okay. um, what I really like about this design. On top of it just being kind of weird and whatever. Yeah. Is some of it, some of the value comes from messing around with your stuff, right? Like mm-hmm. getting, <laughs> taking away first strike or flying or trample from one of your creatures and giving it to my own. Yeah. I can imagine how that's useful, particularly in the flying and first strike case, because it might go from uh, I can't block to you can't block. In okay, both sure. instances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> if you have a creature with shadow, and I don't. We're back in the same spot. We swap. <laughs> we, we, sw- we swap. <laughs> but you having shadow and me not or vice versa is the same thing, <laughs> sure. which is just 
that combined with the rate, I, uh, I, I have this one. This one makes me laugh every time I see it. That's the first time I've seen that card. So very good. Uh, my answer is shadow adjacent. I chose circle of protection shadow because enough, because enough of this. I know you said earlier, it's like a nice way to be able to handle shadow, find a different way. That is a reasonable argument. How about I'm that? not going to argue. I'm saying for the standards of the time, given how circle of protection happy they are, yeah. this is at least more justifiable than most of it. I can, I can just see it now. Some person is new to magic and they really like shadow. Now that person, them really liking shadow is what it is. But that if that's what they're into, that's what they're into, right? I can't block my creatures. I like it thematically, whatever. And their friend is tired of losing their shadow deck, and they just go to the local store and just like, I would like two circle protection shadows. Cool, you don't get to play anymore. At least, you know, that one of the two colors most heavily indexed in shadow is white. So there's at least some interaction. True. Yeah, maybe I've, maybe I've just been... Uh, appeal to moderation bias into the ground here if i think this is even remotely justifiable but for some reason it bothers me less than the other circles like i'm surprised that they don't have circle protection slivers and circle protection flowstone and everything sure. else and circle protection spikes because they bring back the other five and they're like wait we must bring back we must make one more yeah. and it's just it's a lot uh the or excuse me the doom blade award for best non rare in the set uh we have the same answer again do you know what it is I believe lotus petal that is correct i try to answer in the spirit of the award which to me means any card that very obviously should just be a rare gets excluded which uh gets rid of reanimate for example okay um and but- and ancient tomb yeah an ancient yeah. tomb lotus petal spiritually feels like an uncommon to me even though it's just not a thing magic would do nowadays yeah so i, I give it the nod uh we're gonna move on to the aboro palace in the clouds award for fun of one of in the set uh my answer is humility uh it's not a card that oftentimes that people play multiple copies of in my joe Lissette story from earlier in the show it was just a one of for him uh and it just feels like the kind of card that you don't need to play multiple copies of I believe I voted for Scroll Rack. That is correct. Yeah. It's like Sensei's Divining Top, except sometimes it gets so unwieldy that you can't even really manage what's happening anymore. <laughs> People like this thing for the same reason they like Divining Top. Fun card. People online to report it sometimes. Okay. Uh, we have the Mystic Confluence Award for Best Vintage Cube Card in the set. Do you remember your answer? I believe I selected Reanimate. That is correct. I am a sucker for Reanimate. Okay. I'm sorry. It's not always good. A lot of times you first pick it, deck doesn't really materialize. Mm-hmm. That ain't stopping me. That's fine. I'll be I'll I'd ra- I'll be dead in the cold ground before I pass a reanimate. Target their stuff. Yeah, someone's got something. Yeah, there, there's something in the graveyard. Uh, I selected ancient tomb. Uh, I don't take it all the time, but I do take it pretty highly. And you know, vintage cube is about fast mana mostly, so this does a really nice job of that. Because who cares about two, six, twelve life if they're dead? Yeah, I think. I think Cedric's answer is better. I think Ancient Doom is a stronger card on average than Reanimate, but I'm not passing Reanimate. We are who we are. Yeah. Smothering Tide Award for best commander card in the set. As always, I went over to my uh, to my friends over at EDH Rec, which never makes him happy. And the answers were uh, Ancient Tomb and Reanimate. So whichever one of those <coughs> comes up is apparently most played. I initially voted for um, Legacies of Lore. Okay. Just because, again, the principles are strong there of very powerful over a long timeline and a really political dynamic to the nature of Commander. Yeah. Eventually, went to Propaganda. This is one of the f- first cards that I saw people explicitly play in a multiplayer setting even before Commander was a thing. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, we move on to the Smothering Tide. Oh, no, we don't. We move on to the Pack Red Award, excuse me, for best limited card in the set. Uh, Patrick and I have the same answer. I, you know, I was curious if we were going to come to the same answer here because there's this, there's 300 plus cards to look over when we're doing this. Sometimes we just want to pick one. And I was really combing over the set and then I ran into rolling thunder and I was like, it can't be anything but rolling thunder. Well, this one's really a hoot cause it's a common. I thought it was uncommon. It is a common. Okay. It's like when they that's why I get, was this the absolute best card in the set that you could possibly open? No. But bonus, much like Flood, bonus points for being a common. Yeah, okay. All right. I didn't know it was a common. <laughs> yeah. I assumed it wasn't uncommon because that's what it would be nowadays. Right. I but. mean, it was busted in the Ildrazi set, and that was a set with a bunch of big creatures in it. This is all just two ones for two. 
Yeah. Okay. Yep. Confirmed common. Cool. You can just have, <laughs> you just, if, if your draft goes well, you can have like three of these in your deck. Yeah. What did we learn from Caravac's Torch? Uh, just, uh, it, it, Caravac's Torch was probably just too easy to splash. Yeah, sure. Put a second <laughs> red pip on it and we'll just move along. Uh, let's move on to a new award, everybody. I'm sure some of you out there were wondering if we were ever going to introduce any new awards to this show. You've certainly uh, proposed some that I've soundly ignored, but I have one here for you. The Circle of Protection Award for Best Hoser in the Set. My selection is chill. Suck on that, Red Mages. <laughs> you don't get to play. Iconic for not letting Red Mages, Red Mages play number one, but more importantly, Ben Rubin. You know this story, don't yes. you? With Dump Truck? Uh-huh. Ben Rubin, Magic Hall of Famer, kept a no land hand <laughs> on the play against a red deck. I'm pretty sure it was on the play because I'm pretty sure he just passed in the first turn uh, because he had chill and chrome locks in his hand. And if he drew a land, he could play turn one chill or turn two chill or whatever and effectively lock the red deck out and also play other things. And so he kept. And did draw a land, played a chill, and went on to win the game. And I think the tournament, which was a Grand Prix in mm. Phoenix. When you're right, you're right. I think that's I think that's all everything that happened. Yeah, I, I have a my vague recollection is that the tournament was in the Bay Area. Oh, I know it was in Phoenix. You know it's in Phoenix. I know it was okay. in Phoenix. I wasn't there, but yeah. I only know that because mutual friend of our Kyle Bodie was there. Uh I'm gonna Google dump truck Ben Rubin Phoenix. See what happens. Here we go. This was this was quite the Ben Rubin bro. First of all, you know, you guys all kind of know me and how I feel about it. it was in Anaheim. God, I feel like a fucking idiot. Well, I was I was wrong too. What'd you think? I said Bay Area. Okay. I was pretty sure it was in Phoenix. Anyway, uh he did win the GP, so I got that right. Uh deck names always a weird subject with me. Mm -hmm. Dumb truck is a great deck name. Yeah. It is a great deck name. Where are the oh the oh, whoa. The Chrome Moxes are in the board. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. Four chill, three Chrome Mox in the board. That's fun. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's your winner for basically biggest hater? I selected Parish. There you go. Well, the real kicker for me on this one is can't be regenerated. Yeah. You really just had to make that, you know, the idea of killing six of your opponent's creatures for three mana, but maybe they kept their river boa. Mm -hmm. You're like, no. No, not even that. Not even that. It's all gone. Absolutely not. Uh, let's move on to the Char Rumbler Award for weirdest card in the set. You, uh, you, okay, you told me you want me to read this one. Yeah, I don't even know how it works still. Okay. It's blue? Yeah. You want to tell them what it is? It's a duplicity? That's what you, that's what you put. All right, go get this one up. Okay. I, st I don't even know how it works. I want to see if you can figure it out. All right, here we go. I'm going to read the original version before I click on the card on Scryfall and it tells me how it works. Uh, okay. It's three blue blue. When duplicity comes into play, put the top five cards of your library face down on, on duplicity. This is an enchantment. During your upkeep, you may exchange all the cards in your hand for the cards on duplicity. Okay, a little swap. At the end of your turn, choose and discard a card. <laughs> okay. If you lose control of duplicity, put all cards on it into owner's graveyard. Okay, there's a lot going on here. Yeah, what really sent me what really sent me over was the at the end of your turn discard. Why are the discard? Card. Why? I guess it's because you're supposed to kind of run out at some point. I guess I don't really know. This is a very weird design. It's also pretty weird to do in a set with scroll rack. This is kind of like the same thing, except unappealing and confusing. Okay, so that's a that's a weirdo. They love to make a weirdo card though. Uh, my answer is Heartwood Giant. Uh, and I went with this. This is a three GG. Uh, so five mana, four, four sack of forest, heartwood giant deals two damage to target player. Uh, I think it's funny. Just the idea of some gigantic giant, just picking up trees and throwing them at someone, uh, but also green would never ever have this be a thing in the color pie. This is very off message. They would never like, if this were a red giant and it said sack a mountain, that would make sense. Yeah. Huge red giant throwing mountains at people. Okay. Green would never do this. So uh, that's a weirdo that got through somehow. Blank award for best card name in the set. My answer is Puppet Strings, uh, which I think is one, a cool card name, but two, the card actually 
uh, what it does, which is tap or untap target creature, is in line with what puppet strings would be. So I think that's cool. Uh, your answer is meditate. Um, just a really nice merging of a word people recognize with a mechanic that makes sense for it. Um, I dock it slightly because I think meditate should be the name of a white card, not a blue card, but it's still a really great uh, blend there. Uh, we're moving on to the John Avon Award for best land artwork in the set. My answer is Ancient Tomb. If you take a deeper look at that card, uh, it's very clear what it is and what it's doing. They're in a graveyard. There are spirits everywhere. It's cool. Your answer. I'm going to actually change my la- answer to Ooh. the. I had one before, but then I, I, it turned out I read the card wrong and now I want to update. Okay. I'm going to go call Dara Lake. Okay. I think that does a really nice job of conveying the brutality of the world. It looks like a red blue dual land and a lot of the other duels, um, especially in that enemy color cycle look just kind of blurry and not super well defined. Caldera Lake, you can tell right away. That's a red blue duel. All right. Uh, last, but certainly not least, uh, we're moving on to the Aurelia's Fury Award for most overhyped card during previous season and the Tarmogoyf Award for most underhyped card during previous season. I, of course, was not playing Magic in a meaningful way at the time, but you were. So for Aurelia's Fury, you have... Lobotomy. Frog. Really fun and appealing. And it wasn't even a zero when constructed. Just very, very overrated. Because the people kind of... You have the mill experience mm-hmm. here. You have the Jester's Cap experience. Mm-hmm. But what really puts it over the top is uh, if you're quote-unquote good at Magic, you're like, well, I also... I'm even on cards. Okay. All these other cards are card disadvantage. This is card parity. Okay. Or maybe even card advantage. Okay. Okay. Uh, the underhyped card? Curse scroll. All right. So we're finally here. I know you've activated this one more than most people on the planet. So go ahead and just whack some poetic. Well, it's, it's the issue here is the card is so bizarre that it obfuscates the fact that it's so busted when you get down to one card. Yep. That's why it's underrated. If this card said basically one mana artifact, tap it in three, uh, deal two damage to a target, use this ability only if there's one card in your hand, that card is weaker than Curse Scroll. Okay. Because sometimes you have two mountains in your hand, or you can at least just roll the dice some amount of the time. Okay. But people would have much more quickly caught on to the fact that that card was strong. Sure. This is then the... There's so many kind of weird conditions going on here and unappealing elements that it hides the straightforward application of the card. It is a weirdo on first yeah. look, but it's obviously quite good. Well, everyone, and to a certain someone out there who's a member of our Patreon, this one's for you. We've got one thing left to do. All right, everybody, before we close this episode down, uh, we got to give a shout out to my apparel company and sponsor of the show, Coalesce Apparel and Design. You can head over to coalesceapparel.shop, the number one source for Magic the Gathering inspired apparel, to check out their selection of shirts, hoodies, stickers, play mats, and a whole bunch more. If you find something you like, be sure to use promo code RESLEAVABLES at checkout to save 10% off your order. Coalesce Apparel and Design, nobody made what they wanted, so they made it themselves. Alrighty, partner. Mm-hmm. Uh, what card won the set and why? I'm, I am going to break with the spirit of this award. How well, your, gonna, your spirit of the award. And I'm going to give this to a card that was a big part of my boyhood dream store, you know, going to Friday Night Magic with all my pals and playing casual games and playing type two and us trying to like shark the tournaments and all that. I'm going to give it to booby trap. Oh, okay. I did not see this coming. Do you want to go look up booby trap? Okay. Let me get booby trap out of the old bin here. Read this one out loud. Uh, I vaguely remember what this does. Six mana artifact. When booby trap comes into play, name a card other than a basic land. Whenever target opponent draws any cards, he or she reveals those cards to all players. If any of those cards is the named card, sacrifice booby trap and it deals 10 damage to that player. Boom. Okay. 
So boyhood dreams, a lot of trading going on. People bring binders, you know, whatever. And someone that I went to high school with and who was, you know, part of the scene there, we would go together to the store. Name of Justin Page. Okay. And Justin had a binder of things that he would trade. He also owned a copy of the card Booby Trap. Okay. And every Friday, he would put the Booby Trap somewhere in his binder. Because what he would do is, you know, if he had four copies of a card, let's say, he would not put one, two, three, four. He would put all four into one of the sleeves. Yeah, okay. So he would hide the booby trap underneath one of the cards. And if you were trading with him and you pulled out and revealed the booby trap, trade was canceled and he wouldn't trade with you for the last night. (laughs) Okay. And I think that's awesome. It's one of my favorite things about magic that I've ever been around. Okay. No matter, I, you know, been to Japan, Italy for Pro Tours. Yeah, we've traveled everywhere. I've gotten to cover magic tournaments. You've won, some, to, you've won some real tournaments. I've won some tournaments. I get to do this. This is like a lot that the game has given me. There's very few things that compare to the booby trap getting revealed and Justin being like, okay, trade's off. <laughs> it's the nuts. It's the greatest thing of all time. You know, this is the thing I'm going to miss. I guess um, this is the thing that I love about magic that I miss from being young and playing it, which is just the random shenanigans that would happen at the local store. Yeah. There's nothing like it. Cause like you can't get it back now. Like right. what are we we're your early forties. I'm late thirties. We're going to go to the LGS, hang out there a couple days a week. Yeah. I mean, we're trying to trade. Yeah. Like trade cards. Busy. Yeah. You know, like that's not happening, No, but you know, going to the LGS when you were in your adolescence and it's like, yeah, I can hang out here, play some games with my friends, have a couple of sodas and crappy chips and play our cards and play pretty badly and maybe buy a new pack of sleeves. And hopefully the store owner is cool. There's not a lot of table space, but like, who cares? Right. It's just kind of like home away from home. And like this sort of nonsense that would happen. Yeah. There's no comparison. Trap or, you know, when my friends, I, I can't remember everything we used to do at ground zero, but you know, a lot of people played halo and would be ridiculous around halo. Mm-hmm. Right. And gold nine and stuff like that. And it's just like, you know, you'd walk in from school and it's just like, okay, Brandon here, Bob's here, Marty's here. Like just the people, you know, right. And it's just like this, it really is like this home away from home. Right. Yeah. That you spend a lot of time at, you've got your buddy over here with this booby trap. You're just like, I can't wait to see who's going to get this week. Yeah. Right. That's just awesome. And it, it's, it's what was so good about it was, it didn't happen every week. Sure. Because he had a big binder. And okay. some, some some nights there's more trading than others, right? Sure. Yeah. So it's not like every single week someone got the booby trap, but it happened. It's awesome. Trades off. Yeah. Uh, much like you, I'm going against the spirit of this award, which was not planned. And neither of us knew this. Uh, my answer is Jackal Pup. Because uh, that is what we call our loyal following on Patreon. And yeah, sure, the card is good, and you've cast a lot, and I've cast it way less than you, but I've casted some and playing Red Deck Wins and Extended. Um, but, you know, we like to call the fans of the show Jackal Pups. And so uh, it would be it would be disrespectful for Jackal Pup to not win something here this weekend, and so it does. A lot of love for that card. Absolutely. So we're going to give this set a grade next, and I'm going to go first. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, I came under some scrutiny with my weather light grade. Okay. People did not like that I gave that set of two, but I stand by it. I stand by my grades. I'm going to stand by this grade. I'm going to give Tempest an eight. Uh, is this set maybe a little too juiced? Yeah. And do I like juice sets to a degree? Because, you know, like uh, Throne of Eldraine did not like that juice set. Mm-hmm. Oko and Gilded Goose and Wicked Wolf and everything. Ugh. Once upon a time. Remember that one? So not every juice set is good, but I will say that I think magic kind of needed a juice to set at this time just to kind of explore the possibilities of what was possible. Now, did they maybe go a little too far in future sets like Saga Block, which we're not that far away from? Well, you can speak to that better than I can, but I know the answer is yes. But I think just kind of giving the game a little bit of oomph with some of these cards, I think is Mostly for the best, and it is fun to talk about. And some of these cards aged well, and some of them didn't. You know, Ancient Tomb's too powerful. Lotus Petal's probably too powerful. Uh, Wasteland, LOL. But I think it's just kind of cool that they just kind of went for it with this set. So that's number one. Number two, they're finally, like, 
actually telling a story in a meaningful way and introducing characters. And if you read the Tempest storybook, maybe you get attached to those characters in some form or fashion. And that's kind of cool. And then, uh, even though myself personally, I don't love the art direction of the set. Like I think the Tempest lands are ugly. They're meant to be ugly, Mm -hmm. right? They're trying to do that. We talked about it earlier about how brutal they're trying to be with setting the environment for wrath. And so I actually think that even though like visually it's not that appealing to me, I can appreciate what they're trying to do and the execution of it, I think is actually quite good. So I think they got a a lot of things right with Tempest as far as they're starting blocks um, they're introducing characters in a real story. Yeah, buy box buyback's not great. Shadow's not great. Some of these, I mean, enough of the circle protections, please. But you know, there's also there is in Magic. It is fun sometimes to play with powerful stuff. And this set, you got the opportunity to play with powerful stuff, and I think that's that's worth a lot. My grade is going to be a little bit lower than yours. I give Tempest a six. Okay, so. What I do like about the set, Slivers, one of the most beloved things of all time. Slivers, ma- slivers are cool. Magic has ever done. Yeah. Um, the creative storytelling and actually like making characters that you care about and sort of a plot arc that you can follow. The set way ahead of its time. Yep. Um, I think there is an argument for, broadly speaking, making a powerful set given where magic was kind of at at the time. Okay. The things that I don't like about it, capsize and shadow are two of the worst mechanics of all time through the lens of buyback. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So I thought you purposely said capsize because that's obviously the buyback card. Yeah. But sorry, that's okay. Buyback and shadow, I think are two of magic's worst mechanics of all time through the lens of how good are the design principles and then how well balanced are the cards that they appear on. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of mechanics that I've talked about over the years where, you know, really good design principles, execution, bad, not great design principles, but actually for what it is, the cards are pretty well made. This is really rough on both ends. And we haven't gotten to all the buyback cards yet. No. Uh, Yeah. Cause it gets, Oh, there's some doozies coming. The one I always think of is slaughter. I mean, what are we, what are we doing? Oh, mine is flowstone flood. Uh, Also tough. Yeah. Also tough. Forbid. Really rough. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I think uh, another element that I don't like is even though I appreciate the art sensibilities and the way that it crafts a world and the contrast from Mirage, the sets are, I think, is just a little bit too intense. Okay. Part of the reason that. I love Jackal Pup so much. It's a somewhat cute and whimsical piece of art and a set that is otherwise really lacking on, uh, of it. And just a little bit of like lightening up the mood in some specific places. It doesn't have to be all over the place, but the, the bottle gnomes, that's another great example of that. That's cute and not super serious and not super intense and not conveying that to you, the viewer that the world is about to end. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I think that the set kind of needs a more of that aesthetic. I know that it's dissonant with, you know, the story that they're trying to tell, but not everything has to be about the story you're trying to tell. It's okay to mix it up a little bit. And I think the the set would be better off for dialing that down five or 10%. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, it's time to do some shilling. So here we go. Uh, if you liked what you watched, you're probably watching on YouTube. Some of you are watching on Patreon, but we're going to start with YouTube first. Uh, you can subscribe on YouTube right here at youtube.com slash the receivables, where you can find our most recent episode of the receivables in which we reviewed portal and Weatherlight and all the sets before it. You can find our most recent episode of the receivables tournament edition pro tour, Los Angeles, 1996, a real humdinger of an episode uh, right now as well on YouTube, as well as all of our previous episodes of the receivables tournament edition. You can find snippets of our unsleeved podcast. That is a Patreon exclusive podcast, which we'll talk more about here in just a moment. And you can, of course, watch our crack a pack videos where we will be having a Tempest crack a pack coming up here very soon. How can they win? Oh, well, that part's easy. 
If you go over to patreon.com slash the receivables, you can sign up for our Patreon. That gives you access to our unsleeved podcast along with a, a variety of other benefits. If you subscribe at the $10 or $25 tiers, you are automatically entered into any of the pack openings that we do. It doesn't require any additional sign up. You don't have to notify us. There's no raffle, nothing like that. It is an automated process. And when we do our pack openings uh, for Patreon and for YouTube, we open up one pack that we just have a good time with. And then another pack is sent out to one of our Patreons at the $10 or $25 tiers. Super easy. So let's talk a little bit more about Patreon. As Patrick mentioned, patreon.com slash receivables. You'll get access to early releases of both the receivables, like this episode you just watched, if you're watching on YouTube, and the receivables tournament edition. You're going to get complete access to the unsleeved podcast where Patrick and I talk about whatever we feel like talking about each week and also answer our wonderful reader questions that are get emailed in on the regular. Uh, and then as Patrick mentioned, the crack pack videos, you're eligible to win the extra pack from the crack pack, but also you get early access to that when it does get released because it gets released on Patreon first. Uh, if you're a Twitter person, uh, you can follow us on Twitter at the receivables. And I don't want to leave here without shouting out our sponsors, tales of adventure, uh, eternal lives there. You can use promo code receivables for 5% off your order. Coalesce Apparel and Design. No one made what they wanted, so they made it themselves. Uh, promo code receivables for 10% off. And our newest sponsor, uh, Bosch and Roll, the YouTube channel that is hosted and created by one Brian Colville, who is secretly just a total ringer at Magic. Total ringer. Good poster. Really good poster. And my standards for that are pretty high. It's true. And if you are interested in watching some of these Tempest cards in action, go check out his channel. That's right. A lot of focus on vintage and legacy, uh, CEH. And uh, that's a format that's known to have a reanimate here, an ancient tomb over there, a wasteland up and down. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get some real current living experience with these cards, make sure to check out the Bosch and World channel. So what's next? Well... On the Receivables Tournament Edition, it's going to be Pro Tour Columbus 1996, which was won by Ali Rod, with a deck that everyone appears to believe is terrible. Uh, so I'm kind of excited to play with it. We're going to be recording that in about a week and a half or so. Uh, but as far as the Receivables is concerned, Stronghold is up next, which is for Volrath Stronghold. There's more storytelling to be done. Uh, there's more cards to go over. There's, of course, the... Uh, the return and growth of buyback and shadow. Oh yeah. We're really kicking the tires on how you can play the same card over and over again, mm -hmm. but maybe most, not the most importantly, but maybe for some people, the most exciting element, one of our highest leverage crack a packs that we are going to do. Yeah. Mox diamond. Ooh. Sliver queen. Oh yeah. There's some real hitters in there. Okay. Okay, that's a crack of path worth signing up for. Uh, those are the things coming down the pipeline. Of course, the Unsleeved podcast is happening basically every single week and crack of packs and all that jazz. But we are done here. I hope that you enjoyed learning way too much about Tempest. We've gone over just about everything we could. So for Patrick Sullivan, I am Cedric Phillips. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you back here for Strong. The lugging it around was an ambitious idea when the show started. Camera there. Uh -huh. Camera there. Yeah. Suck it. Suck it. Yeah. All right. Uh, that's yours. Thanks, okay. Uh, you're going in that shirt, no sleeves? Hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> Love it. Okay. <laughs> Here we go.